This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. So I, I, I should probably start by yeah, giving some of the backstory around you know, these coins and this concept of giving me coins. Uh, so, you know, first of all, you know, Shiba Inu, as you said, is this uh, kind of knockoff of Dogecoin, right? And Dogecoin was this initial uh, kind of fun coin that was created back, I think, around 2014 or so. And it was just created by Jackson Palmer and uh, like put it out as a joke for a couple of hours and a community formed around it. And... At the beginning, people didn't take it very seriously. I actually remember putting about $25,000 into Doge sometime around 2016. And I just remember uh, just thinking to myself, like, okay, how am I going to explain my, to my mom that I just invested $25,000 into dog coins? And yeah. like, what even are dog coins? Like, the only interesting thing about this coin is that there's, you know, a logo of a dog somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, of course, that ended up being one of the best investments I've ever made. And uh, it did really well. And then at the end of uh, 2020, Elon Musk, of course, you know, started talking about Dogecoin. And the market cap just like shot up to about $50 billion. Actually, and it shot up multiple times, right? Like the first time it went up from about 0 0.8 cents to about like 7 cents. And this just happened all in one day. And I remember um, this was when I was still in uh, Singapore in the middle of uh, COVID. And it, I saw that the price just went up by a thousand percent. And I was like, oh my God. My Doge is worth like a lot. And so I yeah, immediately called up some of my friends and told them to like drop everything and scramble. And I yeah, sold half the Doge and uh, I got $4.3 million, donated the proceeds to give directly. And a few hours after I did this, the price dropped back down from about seven cents to four cents, right? So I managed to sell the Doge at the top. And I remember just uh, feeling like I was such an amazing trader. But then, of course, you know, the price went up from four cents, then to seven, and then 50, and just. Like Doge becoming this big phenomenon where there's even a lot of people that have heard of Doge that have not heard of Ethereum is just like something even I wasn't predicting, right? And so after that, of course, you know, we have Doge and then people are thinking, well, you know, if the leading dog token is worth $50 billion, then surely the second largest dog token deserves, you know, at least seven or eight billion, right? Like I feel like that's the kind of what the mindset of these uh, Shiba people is. Um, so then, of course, they did this other gimmick, right, where they gave me half the Shiba token supply. Um, they were actually not the first projects to do this. Uh, so around the end of 2020, there was this weird project called Teller. It's like T-E-L-L-O-R. I think they're a chain link competitor or something like this. But I remember they just like dumped $50,000 worth of their token into my wallet. And then they had their Twitter RB just like basically run around saying, look, look at Vitalik's wallet. Vitalik holds Tellers. He's one of us. He's a supporter. And as soon as I discovered this, I just like publicly sold the Teller tokens on Uniswap. And this created a bit of a Twitter splat. Now, the Shiba people were more clever. The Shiba people, instead of dumping to that wallet, they dumped to my cold wallet, right? So in a like, cryptocurrency, right, there's this concept of like cold wallets and hot wallets. Basically, like the thing that actually owns your money is like this 80 digit number called a private key, right? And a hot wallet is when that private key is just stored in memory on your, on your computer, on your phone, really easy to access. Cold wallet means it's either on written down on a piece of paper or it's uh, on a computer that's just never accessed the, the internet, right? So cold is very inconvenient, but cold is also much more secure, right? Because even if that computer has some like viruses on it, like it's, it's like air gapped, it's not actually going to be able to upload it. So this cold wallet and like, all the money is out of the cold wallet, so it's safe for me to talk about my setup now, right? But it was a laptop that was sitting in Canada, and I also had um, two pieces of paper where I wrote down two numbers on those two pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. One was with me, one was in Canada. And if you add those two numbers together, you get the private key. So because of COVID travel restrictions, and you know this is you know, this uh, cold wallets in Canada, like it's very difficult for me to um, actually access it, right? And I'm not sure if they knew this. Maybe they just got lucky. But like basically, they uh, you know sent a lot of uh, these dog tokens 
into this wallet where I it was very difficult for me to access it. But then I saw these dog co tokens, I saw more and more people talking about them, and then at some point I, real, I realized that like, hey, these things are worth billions of dollars, and like, you know, there's lots of really good things that you could do with that amount of money, and it would actually be a waste to just like see it go. So I made the decision that like I would actually power through and figure out how to like safely like basically get my private key. Um, I actually had to call up my family, tell them to read out their number off of their piece of paper. I uh, entered that into a, a fresh uh, laptop that I bought from Target. Then I uh, put in my other uh, number on my piece of paper, added the two numbers together on the computer. There's the key. And at the same time, like just scrambled for two days, setting up a new wallet for to where I could move my ETH to safely, like getting people to be multi-sig partners, just like doing all sorts of like stuff that, you know, 10 years ago, you would expect to just be part of a cyberpunk, you know, science fiction novel, but you know, now it's all real. So you're doing uh, this all, all by yourself, I, essentially. Most of it by myself. So I need, you have I to need, keep it secret. Right. And I needed my family to um, actually like go and read the, the number on their piece of paper. And then I am um, in my new multi-sig wallet. Like there's other people that are signatories. Um, but, you know, I'm obviously not going to reveal any details beyond that. But, so I did this, right? And I actually managed to like get the private key, make the first transaction that would just move all my ether to the multi-sig wallet so it's safe. And then second transaction, I put the private key on my main computer, then started, you know, like going in and just selling some of the dog tokens and then just like giving them to these uh, different charities. Now, at the time, I actually did not even like ha have any idea of how much you would be able to get, right? Because like on paper, the dog tokens are $7 billion, but like in reality, it's a very liquid market. You know, are you going to crash it by uh, after you sell 1 million worth? Are you going to crash it after 10 million? Are you gonna, uh, might you actually be able to get like an entire 200 million? I had no idea. Um, so I definitely was just of the mindset, like, okay, I mean, I'll sell a bit, maybe I get some ETH and then, you know, donated some ETH to give well, donated some to other groups and then, okay, have some dog tokens. Like I don't have an easy ability to sell more myself, but then I'll just like give them to these groups and like, you know, hopefully they'll do good things with them. Um, it was actually, um, I actually donated at uh, 20% and dumped 80%. Um, okay. yeah, so the COVID, the COVID, um, India group got one batch and then there's another group that got another batch and I don't want to say who they are cause I think that they want to announce themselves at some point. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you, you can see the fact that these transactions were made on the blockchain. Um, but no, it was, uh, just very inter in interesting and unexpected and just an insanely crazy situation. I'm sure there are some things that I uh, probably could have done better. Like uh, I I was actually I was actually talking to some of these charities and I was impressed by just how much uh, money they managed to get out of selling some of these coins. So I I probably could have done better by just like talking more with the uh, traders and actually ensuring that like you know, they can do a better job of maximizing the, val the, the value of uh, of uh, all of them. But like, you know, it was a very stressful time and I did have to act quickly. Like I uh, I did manage to, you know, make a lot of the donations before, like a few, a few days before the great crypto crash happened. Uh, so it was, I and mean, it's difficult to like, Obviously, there's parallel universes in which I did better, but at the same time, there's also lots of parallel universes where because I hesitated more and tried to spend more time thinking, I missed the opportunity. Uh, so, you know, on that, it's like a luck of the draw. And I'm just, you know, happy that uh, it was, everything was uh, able to turn out as well as it did. But psychologically, you mentioned stress. Mm -hmm. How hard was it? Uh, it was stressful, right? I think, well, one of the really stressful parts was just the fact that I uh, had to basically move all of my funds, you know, including the 325,000 Ether from one cold wallet into another hot wallet, or sorry, into another uh, multi-sig wallet. Um, and, you know, maybe the multi-sig wallet had a bug in it. Maybe there's like some mistake I'll make in the middle that causes the, the funds to get lost. Like, you know, that's... 
th that part was stressful, and uh, I uh, was definitely stressing out for two days. I mean, I was triple checking the new wallet. I even did a bit of an audit of the code myself. I uh, wrote my own uh, JavaScript to DAP to make confirmations because Gnosis Safe didn't work with the status wallet well. Um, so th there was def that whole thing was definitely a bit of a marathon. Um, I was also a kind of definitely a bit worried about or uncertain, I guess, how the public and, you know, including the coin communities would perceive the whole thing. Um, but I was actually impressed. Like I, yeah, for every poster that was saying like, no, you know, why, yeah, why did Vitalik like rug pull on us? He was, his wallet was supposed to be a burn address. You know, there's like 10 people that are like, Oh, you know, I thought I was just in this because it's a fun, uh, it's a fun pyramid gambling thing, but instead I uh, ended up being part of this, uh, you know, great public good thing for humanity, and that's like even more amazing. Uh, so, the I, the amount of that that I got was uh, very uh, impressive. So, you know, all in all, you know, I think uh, the dog people did great. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, a big one for me is just this idea that crypto, um, you know, isn't just an opportunity to give people like slightly better ways to sit, to save value and all of these things. Like it's also an opportunity to like basically create these like new digital institutions that could like serve the public good in new ways. Uh, and and. That's something that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, I actually even have this uh, article in Bitcoin Magazine back in 2014 where I basically suggested this idea that you know you would have coins that represent causes and like people would just like buy and accept those coins because they support those causes. So I think it's called markets, institutions, and currencies: a new form of social incentivization or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I, and I'm sure you can find it and throw it in the links. Um, yeah. The so that was interesting to kind of see becoming real and like in general right i think you know public goods are very important and on the internet public goods are even more important right like every single lex friedman podcast is just on youtube and you know anyone can go and see it like there's no way for you to like you know sell it and uh, so that some people can see it but then other people can't see it like you know you could do that but then you'd obviously be you know, reducing your impact. So thank you for making the, uh, um, the, the amazing Lex Friedman podcast so freely available. Exactly. No, and I think one of the kind of philosophical things that I hope to achieve is kind of decouple the concept of uh, public goods, which are incredibly important and are the lifeblood of modern civilization, from the the idea that there like, is is or can be one central organization that represents the public and like perfectly under, uh, understands and can impose their idea of what is the good. Right, like it's. When people talk about public goods, like it just often comes with this baggage of uh, you know either centralization or conformism, and right. I think like it doesn't have to, right? Like uh, often the most important public goods are the ones that are created by you know the crazy individualists that disagree with everyone else. Uh, so trying to make this kind of synthesis where you know you combine the values of decentralization and the values of open source, but you're not naive about it and like you know you realize um that for these things to be produced that there there needs to be a, a way for it to be sustainable there needs to be some way of supporting people who are working these projects but at the same time you want to avoid that turning into a vector of centralization like trying to sort of get all of the good things without the bad things to me that's a yeah a, a big part of sort of what my grand experiment in crypto is about right? and like we are doing things in uh, uh, different kinds of things for this right like there's the the gitcoin grants quadratic funding in the ethereum ecosystem um there's I mean, obviously these uh dog coins that just happens like i guess accidentally um there's other projects um, that, like, for example, you know, Uniswap has um, their Uniswap DAO that just has a huge amount of funding. And, like, we haven't seen yet how that's going to be deployed, but, you know, it could be de potentially deployed to do lots of really good and amazing things. I definitely see Ethereum as uh, being a yeah, mechanism to fight for definitely some spe some specific things that are um, that are social causes um like 
just you know the fact of creating an open financial system that anyone can participate in no matter where they are in the world that's a social cause um just you know giving people the ability to organize and create projects even if it's five people in five different countries I think that kind of inclusiveness I think that's a social cause and it's a core uh, a core crypto value um at this, but then at the same time, like the other important kind of part of the magic of Ethereum that you have to balance that against is that it is also this open platform where ultimately, you know, the thing that go uh, the things that are on Ethereum is just the things that the community makes of it. The the best case is um that um you know blockchains continue to prosper and we figure out scalability so that people can actually start doing things on block like all you know all of the amazing use cases that people have been talking about instead of today where a lot of the great stuff gets priced out because you know transaction fees are at five to ten dollars mm -hmm. and then we see a lot of different um amazing applications happening on blockchains you know it could be like DAO is creating you know, new ways for people to inter interact and organize with each other, new ways for artists to get funded, and, and just all sorts of these amazing things. And there's just enough public, um, public support and just enough people that see that, you know, look, crypto is clearly doing a lot of good things. Uh, and, and, you know, there, there are definitely areas where there's tensions, but in there is areas where there's tensions like there could be some kind of creative and interesting approaches that get figured out right like you know the concept of corporate taxes for example right like you know it does it, it it that would disappear as a revenue stream if theoretically corporations just all get replaced by DAOs. but you know like maybe there's some other creative way by which you know DAO, like DAOs themselves can kind of be, co um, you know, have some kind of encoded governance that ensures that they you know, have at least some of us, some kind of bias towards ser serving the global public good. And, uh, you know, maybe it does enough of, uh, DAOs can do enough of that that people are happy with it. And, and you know, th there are going to be things that people are unhappy about. There's always going to be the people that, you know, wants to surveil everyone. But if th on the, the kind of, effect of crypto from just empowering people is greater than that and greater than that in a way that people can just easily see then you know that would be a good scenario right and we'll just like become incorporate uh, kind of incorporated and accepted the same way as happened uh, with the internet um but the wor in the worst case scenario would of course be just like people su like suddenly you know flipping and going into moral panic mode and just you know oh my god like this technology is used by like you know insert bad group of the day and then i don't think governments have the ability to ban crypto to the extent of just complete like preventing blockchains from existing but they definitely have the ability to really marginalize it right like if you just ban all exchanges like can ban all links from the fiat ecosystem to crypto and you know you ban all a kind of mainstream employers from uh, accepting or paying in cryptocurrency then like you could you can successfully uh, like turn it into a yeah uh, like you know a, a fairly kind of niche countercultural thing that mm, has much less impact than it otherwise would so it's somewhere between the good scenario and the bad scenario i'm obviously hoping for the good mm -hmm. There's always that possibility, but like at the same time, I think if you look at you know the world as a whole and like the way all the other technological trends are going, like you know in-person surveillance is just going up every year, right? Yeah. Like the if you commit a crime in you know meat space, it's getting harder and harder to get away with it. Uh, so like you know if you wants to do something, and and this is something that's just like happening as a result of you know just better technology information and information transparency like a lot of it's hard to prevent even if you really tried um so i the world where like things go dark to such an ex um you know as the the one the police hawks sometimes like to say um to such an extent that like you know oh my god the, the criminals are committing crimes with impunity and we can't uh, see anything like that just seems unlikely yeah. um but you know on the other hand like uh, the, the world uh where there just you know is no privacy for example or um the world where there just like 
is no ab- no ability to uh, kind of act outside of the the confines of uh, you know mainstream institutions like that's uh, some that's something that's more realistic and that seems like something that uh, could lead to a lot of uh, kind of a lot of scary things right and like even from a government's point of view right like i think like, governments over the last few years a lot of them they're very worried about sovereignty you know they're worried about like if their um, country is economy is and you know social environments are just completely dependent on basically foreign tech companies controlled by foreign governments like you know governments are not on team government right it's like you know the uh, indian government is on you know team india you know the russian government is on team russia and so forth right so like you know, they don't want the U.S. to be able to like have this big backdoor into everything. Uh, so, I mean, I do think that a balance is needed, but and at the same time, I yeah, do think. Um, I guess I I definitely like worry more about the the side the possibility that just like without things like crypto, uh, kind of acting outside of institutions becomes too impossible. And I don't even necessarily mean outside of governments, even just, you know, outside of corporations, like becomes too impossible. And there's just like terrible things that come as a result. Um, and if things going in the other direction, like, I mean, it obviously is a, ri- uh, a risk, but you know, at the same time, I think in the long term, like a crypto can potentially even like offer defenses as much as attacks against that sort of thing. The other thing to keep in mind, of course, is that the the set of like the kinds of things that just like payment processors as companies try to restrict people you from is much larger than the set of things that's illegal, right? Right. Like part of that is because they want to be super conservative, and like the more layers you have, the more they're like cons- conservative because they're scared of what what the what the layer below them will do to them. Um, sometimes they have their own, you know, moral opinions of various kinds. Like, you know, they go after lots of people, right? Like they make life really hard for, you know, like sex workers, for example, you know, like, you know psychedelics, as you mentioned, there's, uh, a, like a lot of activity, even including stuff that is totally legal that just, you know, there's this like, you know, shadow, like PayPal credit card government or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, you know that makes it just hard to participate in this stuff. So I think like reducing the number of intermediaries is definitely normally a good thing. Sure. Uh, so I think recently we've actually been uh, kind of de-emphasizing the ETH 2.0 branding, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the reason behind that was that like, originally we envisioned something more like a big grand event where, <laughs> you know, all the good things would happen at the same time yeah. and it would be a new blockchain and it would be a new protocol and people would have to take a lot of effort to migrate over. But later we've uh, slowly changed the roadmap over to something that's much more incremental. Um, right. So, you know, proof of stake happens kind of over time and then sharding gets added over time and all these features get added over time. And so the experience for just a regular Ethereum user still feels very seamless. Right. It's like maybe a little bit more complex than the hard forks that we've already uh, done but from a user's point of view, but like not by that much. Right. Uh, so I like the big two things that are happening, right? These are what used to be considered the two flagship features of ETH 2.0, and now they're just, you know, the flagship features of the, you know, the next uh, devolution of Ethereum, yes. yeah, as uh, proof of stake and sharding. Right. So proof of stake is a consensus algorithm. It's a, the, or a consensus mechanism, I should say. Um, it's the difference is that like an algorithm is something that you run by yourself. A mechanism is like, it involves like interactions between people and it could even include incentives and all of that. Uh, so a consensus mechanism, uh, so by which nodes in uh, the network agree on, you know, which blocks came in, which transactions came in, in what order, uh, make sure that once a block gets accepted, it can't get reverted and all of these uh, things that we expect from a blockchain. Um, so existing blockchains, you know, including Bitcoin, including the Ethereum of today and including a lot of them, they use proof of work, right? Uh, so the reason why we need proof of anything is, bec- is because like... 
they serve this function that I call kind of economic uh, civil resistance. Uh, so that, that's obviously, you know, a big word for, uh, especially if you've never heard of civils before. But like the basic idea is, right, that you have a network and you have lots of computers that agree on like which block to accept. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get, you know, two blocks that get published at the same time and you just have to agree in an order. So there has to be some kind of voting game. And, but then the question is, well, in this voting game, you know, who get who gets a vote? Who gets to participate? Now, the pro you can't say one person, one vote, right? The reason why you cannot say one person, one vote is because you need some kind of like authority or some kind of mechanism to say, you know, who the, the humans are. Like, and if you don't have that, then a bad guy could just come in with a virtual machine or with a computer that has on it 10 billion virtual machines that have 10 billion, you know, virtual nodes. And then just like say, look, I'm 99% of the network. I should control everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so to prevent this... What proof of work and proof of stake both do is they basically say, well, the weight of your vote, like how much influence your um, votes have in the consensus is proportional to like what quantity of economic resources you bring in. So in the case of proof of work, you prove what economic resources you have because your economic resources are computers and you prove that you have them by just running them 24-7 using these hash algorithms, right? So this does solve the problem, right? Because in order to attack the network, you have to come in with more computers or, and like more money invested into computers and electricity than the rest of the network put together. And that's extremely expensive. In proof of stake, instead of relying on uh, people with computers that are just constantly cranking out hashes 24-7, you, as your like, unit of economic resources, you just use like holdings of coins inside the system, right? So all of these blockchains, they have some kind of coin in them. Bitcoin has Bitcoin, Ethereum has Ether, um, you know, they all have a coin. So why not just use that as the economic, re the economic resource that you're using to like measure participation? Um, so... That's like the core I, distinction between proof of work and proof of stake. Um, I like proof of stake and I've liked proof of stake for many years, basically because like it just requires much less ongoing resource consumption, right? Like with proof of work, um, you know, you have to like actually go and buy these physical computers. And these days, um, you know, yeah, they have specialized hardware, ASICs, um, application specific integrated circuits. You have to go produce them and you have to go buy them. And unless you have millions of dollars, you know, you have to buy them from one of these other people who creates them. And those other people often end up taking a huge cut of the profits themselves. Uh, and then, you know, you have to plug them in, you have to just um, burn all of this electricity that's just um, running 24-7. So it consumes a huge amount of energy, right? And it can, and not just energy, it also, you know, just to create the hardware, right? Like people focus a lot on energy, but like actually about half the cost of proof of work mining is the cost of the hardware. Um, so hardware is a very big deal too. Um, and you know you need this like these this really big and powerful like, very specialized hardware you know the kind that fills up these big warehouses. So proof of stake you don't really, you don't really need that much electricity you just need just a little bit to run a right to run a regular computer. Um, you can run proof of stake validators on computers that you already have. Um, so it's just much less um, resource intensive. And like this is good for a few reasons, right? Like one is you know the kind of environmental rationale that you know you're not breaking the environment. Um, the second is that you're not taking away electricity and, and like other resources from other people, right? Like right you now, there's I think just today I saw a story about like Iran wanting to shut down some Bitcoin mining because it was just grabbing up so much electricity that it was you know outbidding the nearby towns and they just it didn't have enough. Um, and then. There is a like Chia, the, the one that's doing proof of uh, like hard disk mining, basically, is just like grabbing up so many hard disks. So there's a there's a shortage, right? So that's the second reason. And then the third, more selfish reason, is that because participating in consensus does not require so much energy expenditure, you don't need to pay people as much to participate, right? So like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they both issue somewhere around four percent of the total supply every year right now. To miners. So Ethereum is about 4.7 million Ether, and the current supply is about 115 million. But with proof of stake, like we expect it'll be somewhere between 500,000 and 1, and 1 million per year. Um, so, uh, so that means, you know, this, the supply doesn't have to in, increase so quickly. Um, so one of the... 
So I think proof of stake is very secure uh, because in order to be able to attack the system, you need to have like basically as much stake as uh, the rest of the network, right? So that means like right now, for example, we have 5 million ETH staking. So you have to come up with 5 million ETH and then join the network. Mm -hmm. And then the the other, so 5 million ETH is a lot, right? It's like, um, how much is it now? Like $15 billion. So that's actually more than I, I, I believe the cost of um, attacking the Bitcoin network. And then the second thing is that recovering from attacks is much easier in proof of stake than in proof of work, right? Because in proof of stake, you have, like, first of all, we have for many kinds of attacks that you do against this network, we have this concept of like automatic slashing, right? Which basically means that in order to like revert a finalized block, so if there's one block that's like accepted by the network and you try to convince the network to, to kind of revert that block and accept a different block, in order to make that kind of attack, you basically have to have your validator, like a big portion of your validators, sign two conflicting messages. And this is something that, like, once you, th these messages are on the network, like, you can go and prove, like, look, these people did it. And so we have this feature in the protocol called slashing, where you basically take all these people who provably misbehaved and you burn their coins, right? And you don't burn anyone else's coins. Now, there are other cases, like, for example, if instead of reverting blocks, the attack just tries to censor everyone, right? Then what you do, everyone who got censored would just like basically create the minority chain. Um, and then the community would basically have to do a soft fork, right? They would just have to say like, look, this chain is clearly attacking us. This chain is the one not attacking us. And so we're going to join this chain. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is that on that new chain, the attackers also lose a lot of coins. Right. Yeah. So the difference between proof of stake and proof of work is that in a proof of stake system, like you can identify specific participants and you can say, you know, these and like this isn't like, you know, a human going in and saying, I don't like you, I don't like you, I don't like you. This is like automated, right? You can So go, the slashing process is automated. Yes. Uh, is there ways it can go wrong? So that's a painful process where the coins are burned. <laughs> um, it is painful, yes. I think uh, I mean, the one big unknown, of course, is like if an attack actually happens and like if an attack happens that requires the community to actually choose one of these minority forks, then like what would the the community actually successfully coordinating on this look like? Right. Like it, it's like, you know, we can talk about it and we can, you know, write like science fiction novels about it. But like until it's happened, you don't really know the details of like what it looks like and how difficult it is. <laughs> There's definitely talking as well. Um, I mean, like we have to agree on protocol changes somehow, right? Like there's Twitter, there's Reddit, there's um, GitHub, there's uh, all of the various Ethereum forums, Ethereum magicians, Ethereum research. There's just in-person communication. Then there's just kind of like the hidden web of everyone talking to everyone on Telegram yeah. um, or Signal. Uh, so it's like some of everything, right? But like, I think like... The thing to emphasize around, like, can you actually come to consensus on, you know, whether or not to fork the chain because the attacker is censoring some everyone, just for example, is like, you, everyone who's running a node is going to see almost the same thing, right? Like, they're going to be off by a few seconds, and like, maybe they'll be off by a few minutes, they'll, they'll disagree by a few minutes, but like, if it's a serious attack, you know, people are going to know, right? It's not like one of those things where, you know, oh, it... We're trying to agree on like, I don't know, did Epstein kill himself or like some you know, random, <laughs> random yeah. political fact where like in reality, no one knows a single thing about what, what's yeah. actually going on and they're all speculating. Like it, it is much more visible, right? So we do have that. But, you know, at the same time, I'm happy to admit that like these are fairly untested mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But like at the same time, they're also untested mechanisms in proof of work, right? And like in proof of work, it's even harder because in proof of work, you don't have the ability to like identify and say like, you know, I'm going to, these miners attacked. And so we're not going to let these mi uh, um, these miners in, these miners did not attack. So we're going to keep them in. Like you have to pretty much, you know, either um, take out none of the miners or you do a fork that changes the proof of work algorithm, which takes out all of the miners, right? So the, uh, the economic of like recovering from attacks and proof of work, at least to me, actually do seem like more unfavorable. But you know, I'm sure the proof of work people you talk to will give uh, very different and, and contradictory opinions, and that's uh, totally fine and amazing. Sure. Um, how about after this one, we'll also talk about sharding because it's amazing yes. and it's part Let's, of. We'll return too. back to sharding, and we'll, which is 
No, and we'll I, return to the big picture of the scaling problem, as you mentioned. I love, I love this conversation. You know, depth first search instead of breadth first. <laughs> um, so, uh, basically, okay, EBV minor extractable value. Um, it is not different in proof of work and proof of stake, right? So, like, if you want to call it, you know, block proposer extractable value, like it sounds less sexy, but you know, we can call it BPEV instead of MEV. Who cares? Um, but the so, this is a problem in both proof of work and proof of stake. Yes. So the basic idea is um, that if you have the ability to choose which transactions go into a block and in what order, then you have the ability to like take advantage of that position for economic gain in a lot more ways than just collecting transaction fees, right? Mm -hmm. Like for example, there's decentralized exchanges on chain like Uniswap. And like let's say the price of ETH to versus USDC was 2700 the previous block, but then there was a bit of a market drop and now it's 2680 where you can go on Uniswap and you can just like gobble up the entire part of um you know the automated order book that's like between 2700 and 2680, right? And that's and then at the same time you like run a bot and uh, you know you buy some ETH back at 2680 and you've just like made about ten dollars of profit, right? So, or well, ten dollars times you know whatever the depth is, right? So and so there's lots of um, little things like that. There's also things um, that involve like front running other people's transactions. So one example of this would be that if someone sends a transaction that says. Like, I don't know, buy me five ETH for um, wh wh whatever price that you can get. Um, then, but with a maximum of, uh, let's say, yeah, uh, $15,000, then you can go and like you can send each, put a transaction right in front of that transaction and you can like buy up that ETH first oh. and then you resell it to him at, you know, $15,000 minus one. Um, so, there's, and then you get to make a little bit of money that way. Exactly. So there's a lot of these different like arbitrage, front running, back running, these different tricks that allow block proposers to... To get some percentage on top, like overhead. Exactly. Okay. Um, and so, the reason why this is um, a, a challenge is because... Um, it's I mean, like first of all, it's some it sometimes degrades uh, user experience because users get you know less favorable uh, trades. But there are sometimes ways to like mitigate that for applications. Sometimes it's not that bad. But like the bigger risk that I think some people consider more existential is that there's just much more economies of scale in figuring out how to extract all this revenue. I mean, because if you're just collecting transaction fees, there aren't really economies of scale. There aren't really benefits to centralizing, right? Because it's a very simple formula. You just like grab up the transactions that pay you the most. But with MEV, you know, you ha there's all these sophisticated algorithms. And if you have lots of money, then you can hire really smart people to make amazing algorithms. And then you can use the other half of your money to get a lot of mining power or a lot of stake. And you get a lot of opportunities to use your even better algorithms. So there's this risk that like as a result of this mining is basically or proof or even validating proof of stake is going to centralize um so i think the ecosystem's best reply to this sort of risk and it's the direction where projects like flashbots are going already is if you can't eliminate the centralization, then you try to firewall it, right? And the way that you firewall it is you basically say, we're going to try to deliberately create a marketplace where people can just do the complicated work of creating what are called bundles, like oh, the bundles of transactions that like are very profitable, right? And then at, at the other side of the market, you just have like block proposers or miners that are just dumb nodes. And they go and ask the, the what are called searchers, the bundle creators. And they just ask like, hey, like how much can you give me if I put in your bundle? And then they just take the highest offer, right? So you sort of separate out the task and you know you have the easy part and then you have the hard part and you have like this special class of actor called a searcher that does the hard part. And then the easy part, uh, the people doing the easy part, which is just miners and validators, they kind of just talk to all the different people doing the searching and they just, you know, accept the highest bidder, right? So, I mean, this is also just like interesting, uh, an interesting example of like economic design philosophy, right? Like sometimes you can't just like make centralization go away. Sometimes it's inevitable, but you no, know, at least you can try to kind of contain it. You can direct it or you, know, you can even sort of firewall it away from, you know, core consensus, the parts that really do need to be decentralized. So, But, but we'll you don't see it as an existential risk. It's just I mean, a little, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a problem that has to be constantly dealt with. It's a, I mean, it's a risk. Like there's obviously a, a risk that, you know, there, it, it 
it's a very severe problem and that even this Flashbots approach has some fatal flaw or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm definitely like, we're definitely approaching it with the mindset of, you know, this is a problem and like, yes, we do have to do some work to solve it, but we're doing it. And uh, so far it's being solved. <laughs> Uh, so there's two major paradigms for scaling blockchains, right? As uh, you said, layer one and layer two. And layer one basically means make the blockchain itself like uh, capable of uh, processing more transactions by having you know some mechanism by which it can do that, despite the fact that there's a limit to the capacity of each participant in the blockchain. And then layer two says, well, we're going to keep the blockchain as is, but we're going to create clever protocols that sit on top of the blockchain that still use the blockchain and then still kind of inherit things like the security guarantees of a blockchain. But at the same time, a lot of things are done off-chain, and so you get more scalability that way. Um, so in Ethereum, the most popular paradigm for layer two is rollups, and the most popular paradigm for layer one is sharding. Sure. So the way that I think about the trade-off is I think about it as a trade-off between making it easy to write to the blockchain and making it easy to read the blockchain. Right. So when I say read, I just mean, you know, have a node and actually verify it and make sure that it's correct and all of those things. And then by write, I mean send transactions. So I, I think for decentralization, it's, it's important for both of these tasks to be accessible. And I think that they're like about equally important, right? If you have a chain that's too expensive to read, then everyone will just trust a few people to like read for them. And then those people can change the rules without anyone else's permission. But if, on the other hand, it becomes really expensive to write, then everyone will move on to se like basically second layer systems that are incredibly centralized, and like that takes away from you know decentralization and self sovereignty as well. So this has been my viewpoints like pretty much the whole time, right? It's that like you know you need this balance, and going in one direction or the other direction is very unhealthy. In the Bitcoin case, um, basically what happened was that. Bitcoin originally, like at the very beginning, it didn't really have a block size. It just had an accidental block size of 32 meg or, or a block size limit of 32 megabytes because that just happens to be the limit of the, the peer to peer messages. Um, but oh, then, interesting. I didn't even know that part. <laughs> yeah. But then um, Satoshi back in 2010 was worried that even 32 megabyte blocks would be too hard to process. So he uh, put the limit down to one megabyte. And, you know, I think the. If I put, you mean sneaked in there. Yeah, just like made an update to the Bitcoin software that made blocks bigger than one. I think it's a million bytes um, invalid. And I think the impression that most people had at the time is that, you know, this is just a temporary safety measure. And over time, you know, the, as we become more confident in the software, that limit would be and like raised some, uh, so, somewhat. Um, but but then when the actual usage of the blockchain started going up and then it started going up first to 100 kilobytes per block, then to 250 kilobytes per block, then to 500 kilobytes per block. Um, you know, there started a kind of coming out of the, the woodworks, this opinion that like, no, that limit should just not be increased. Uh, and, and, you know, then there are all of these attempts at compromising, right? Um you know, first there was like a proposal for 20 megabyte blocks. Then there was the 248 proposal, which is um, a bit ironic because the 248 proposal started off being a, like a small block negotiating position. But mm -hmm. then when the big block people came back and said like, "Hey, why aren't we aren't we going to do this?" They're like, "Oh no, 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 we don't want we don't want the block size increases anymore." Uh, so, you know, there were. These two different positions, right? The small blockers, I think they valued one megabyte blocks for two reasons. One is that they just like really, really believe in the importance of uh, being able to read the chain. But two is that a lot of them really believe in, in maintaining this norm of never hard forking, right? right? So the difference between a hard fork and a soft fork is basically that in a soft fork, um, blocks that were... Any block that's valid under the new rules was still valid under the old rules. So if you have a client that verifies according to the old rules, then you'll still be able to accept the chain that follows the new rules. Whereas with a hard fork, like you have to update your code in order to stay on the chain. Mm -hmm. And look, they have this belief that you know soft forks are kind of 
either less coercive than hard forks, which by the way, I completely disagree with. Um, I actually think soft forks are more coercive because like basically they force everyone who disagrees to sort of go along by default. Um, but, or they have this um, opinion that um, there's like, it's more difficult to abuse soft forks to do really mean things like, or that like completely violate people's expectations, like increasing the supply, which is like, you know, there, there, I think there is some truth to that. Um, so because of, you know, these reasons, they just say, we're only going to do soft forks and we we don't, we want to just not do any hard forks. And they eventually discovered this idea called segregated witness that allows for like a very tiny block size increase to like the equivalent of about two megabytes, um, with a soft fork. It's, it's just a really like weird and devious trick. Like basically what they do is they take the signatures of transactions and then they put them outside of the block. And then they add an extra rule that says that like every, for a block to be valid, the block has to come with a separate, like basically extension block that contains all of the transaction signatures. Right. So, you know, when you measure it according to the old rules, like, you know, hey, it adds up to less than a million, but actually there's this extension block that the old protocol doesn't even know about. So it's a hack that, that seemed to work to do in a small way extend exactly. the size of the block size. But yeah. so, you know, the small block side was like happy with these very low levels of block size. And then the big block side wanted to expand to, you know, at the very least go to four megabytes, then, you know, maybe go maybe eight, 20. There, there's disagreements within there as well. Um, I definitely was uh, favoring the big side um, the whole way through, as uh, you can probably tell. Um, but even though, so the argument against the big is that uh, it uh, makes things more centralized. Yes, because fewer people can run a node that verifies yes. the chain, and also because any of these things would require a hard fork, and you know, hard forks are inherently risky. Do you think there's truth to that? Um, I'm pro hard fork. I think hard forks are actually like in a uh, you know political economic sense they're better than soft forks. I think soft forks are also upgrading an airplane while it's flying. But it's a smaller upgrades. That's you know, uh, like there's some truth to that. Like yeah. there there's definitely um, there's definitely a bit more risk of like a, a split as a result of a hard fork than as a result of a soft fork. Um, and the s split is highly undesirable, right? But well, it depends. Like if it's a split because of a bug, then that's horrible. If it's a split as a result of political differences, then I think like a split is better than, you know, one side being forced to basically just like suck it up and, ac and accept the majority position, even if it really hates it. It depends. And I think like, well, for blockchains in particular, the costs of, uh, people being able to like peacefully do their, go off and do their own thing are much lower, right? Like, you know, okay, if you have a country and you have two groups, then uh, like often enough, like f fighting out the new rules requires, you know, a civil war requires yeah. everyone to move and so forth. But no, on, on a blockchain, like, you know, the costs are lower. And so. <laughs> I'm definitely disappointed with what happened with the block, with the, the big block side. Um, I think the source of my disappointment is that like one of the things that you notice when just looking at like this political disagreements generally, especially when you have environments where, you know, they're authoritarian or like single party dominated, and then there's some opposition party and the opposition often has like very legitimate grievances. But at the same time, the thing you notice is that often enough, the opposition just sucks, right? Like it just doesn't have, you know, political capacity. It doesn't have like the ability to come up with policy because its entire culture is like designed around resisting much more than it's designed around like, you know, actually debating serious policy trade-offs. And I, f I worry, or I guess not so much worry because it's already happened. I uh, unfortunately think that Bitcoin Cash ended up being a victim of this, right? Like, um, First, you no, know, there was a split with Bitcoin Cash, and then, of course, Craig Wright came in, and you know, Craig Wright was uh, this uh, basically scammer who just keeps on pretending that he is Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of uh, Bitcoin. Hey, Craig Wright's legal team, do you hear me? Yes, I still think your client is a scammer, so sue me. <laughs> 
the analogy that's at the to- at the top of my head will get a bit political, but um, oh boy. that's fine. You've had Michael Malice. Um, <laughs> so um, I guess I view Craig Wright as being kind of like a Donald Trump figure yes. in that like, he's not very intellectual, um, but I think he gets a big audience because he says... He he says things that like play to the resentments that people have, and he says things that uh, people want to hear, right? Like in the in the wake of this block size war, you know, the big walkers did feel very disenchanted. Like they felt that you know Bitcoin always had this vision that we were supposed to just keep increasing the block size, and Bitcoin is peer to peer cash. It says so in the white paper. And then this gr- this elitist clique of core devs just like came in and said, you know, no, 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 we're going to impose this totally different vision. And if you ever want your scalability, you'll have to wait for us to create this this totally unproven fancy technology called the Lightning Network that works on your completely different principles. And you know, they were very angry at this. And I mean, I think like I think a lot of that anger is justified. Um, but at the same time, you know, when people are in that mental state, like it's very easy for you to just kind of like latch on. And if you find someone who expresses anger at the same things that you're angry at, and also like it seems like someone who's strong and seems like someone who, you know, might be good to rally around, it's very easy to just like get behind that. But that extra part about where he's Satoshi Nakamura, I don't understand why that's mm. necessary. I think that's, um, I mean, he could have done it without that, but that, I mean, that just, it's a marketing strategy. Like it gotcha. sort of gives him more salience. Like there's other big block personalities, right? Well, what's the difference between with Craig Wright? He's not just a big, uh, a big block personality. He's potentially Satoshi. Um, and he did say all the big block things, right? Like he talked about how, oh, the concept of a fee market is fundamentally like economically wrong and it should be it should be a free market and you should be able to have blocks as big as you want. Like he repeated all the talking points. And so a lot of people were kind of sucked into that, right? And you know, so he unfortunately was able to basically dominate a big part of the Bitcoin cash community for a long time. And then... Eventually, of course, um, you know, more and more people started to catch on. Um, he would just say technical things that are completely wrong, right? Like one example of this that I um, remember is that he mixed up the concept of 256 bits and two to the power of 256 bits, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, you know, the difference is it's like the difference between, you know, 80 and the concept of 80 digit numbers, right? Um, and because of this, like he made this made this argument arguments that said that Bitcoin that Bitcoin's elliptic curve is friendly to cryptographic pairings. Like you don't have to n- understand what that is, but if you want to know, I have articles on both at Vitalik.ca. Um, <laughs> but but basically he made this like technical argument that really hedged on this point. And then when people when people pressed him on it, it's like Yes, what? No, no, like what? Look, exactly. The the height is like what? Two, two to the 256 bits. That's uh, a very t- uh, a very tiny amount of information. No, 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 no. 200, two to the 256 bits is more than the inf- amount of information in the universe. And like he, you know, equivocated and kind of like preyed on people's inability to un- you know, understand that mathematical nuance. And I called him out. And eventually I even called him out in person at this uh, conference in Seoul. Like I just uh, stood up and asked the, you know, hey, you know, conference organizer, why are you letting this fraud speak at this conference? Yes. And uh, I remember even some big blockers at the time getting angry at me. Um, but, you know, eventually they yeah, did get rid of him and then Craig, well, basically Craig Wright um, was forced to, to split off because the rest of the community refused to accept some network change that he wanted. And so then there was the BCH and BSV. And then in the Bitcoin Cash community, there was this drama of are they going to add a, a developer fund where they redirect 12.5% of the revenue from the miners to the devs? And according to the libertarian non aggression principle, is this technically theft? <laughs> and, uh, um... Yes, exactly. But the point is that like, even after Craig Wright got expunged, the Bitcoin Cash community kept having these disagreements, right? And now yes. ab- after this uh, development funds dispute, there's, there was a further split between Bitcoin Cash and ABC. Um, and so, you know, the, the the branching tree continues to extend, right? So so in that way, it's disappointing to see those kinds of splitting that was never resolved. It is. I would have definitely like wanted to see more of a yeah, kind of like the principled coin with a that like tries to be Bitcoin, but fo- but you know follows consistent big block values. But yeah. I don't know maybe I should just like 
stop expecting projects that I have no involvement in to uh, care at all about what my values are. And, you know, like maybe Ethereum just like is. <laughs> it, it <laughs> just is. So to summarize that big, long tangent that we just uh, went It's a beautiful tangent, by it's the a, way. Yeah, it's, an, it's an amazing tangent. And I think like crypto is just uh, one of the most underrated aspects of crypto is, I think, how you can like analyze the, you know, the sociology and the politics and yeah. the anthropology. And like, yeah, I and mean, I'm sure Dan Carlin would have fun exploring the space at some point. But like the core trade off, right, is that if you scale blockchains the dumb way just by increasing the parameters, then eventually you just make it harder and harder to participate as a node and you end up with a system where there's like 20 computers running the whole thing yeah. and it's just very centralized. Um, so sharding basically says, well, instead of just increasing the parameters, what we're going to do is we're going to change the blockchain architecture in such a way that each individual node in the blockchain only needs to store a small portion of the data and only needs to process a small portion of the transactions. So you can think about it as being like inspired by BitTorrent, right? Like on BitTorrent, there's no such thing as a BitTorrent full node that has every movie, right? It, you know, the work is like split up among a huge number of computers. And like, that makes sense. That's, uh, you know, the only sane way to scale a system like that. Um, and if they actually tried making a version bit of BitTorrent that required full nodes to st that store every movie, then, you know, it would have like zero censorship resistance and it would just like, you know, be dead in an instant. Uh, so... The challenge with taking that model and applying it to blockchains, right, is that blockchains aren't just about like spreading data around. They're about agreeing on exactly what data was spread around and ensuring that everything that you agree on actually is correct. Mm -hmm. And so you have this paradox where, let's say you want to have a system that supports 10,000 transactions a second, but each computer in the network can only personally verify 100 transactions a second. So how can each computer get a guarantee about the other 9,900 without actually going and verifying them themselves. Yep. Um, and it turns out that there are some, um, like a bundle of different tricks that can do that, right? So like one of them is uh, just random sampling. So the idea behind random sampling is like, let's say for simplicity, this is a, a proof of stake chain and you have 10,000 validators. Validators are like, you know, the stakers. And like for simplicity, we'll assume they all have the same number of coins, right? If someone has more coins, we'll just kind of split them up and pretend they're 10 stakers. Then you, you, use, you do like some random shuffling and you basically say, these random 100 validators are assigned to validate this block. These random 100 validators are assigned to validate this block. These random 100 validators are assigned to validate this block. And so each individual computer only gets assigned to validate like a small piece. But then the way that the information about like what's valid gets passed around, right, is that when these hundred participants um, validate a block, they all sign a message basically saying like, yes, we agree that this block is valid. And then like they combine that signature into one and then they broadcast that signature. And then everyone else, instead of verifying the blocks directly, just verifies that signature, right? And so if I see the signature, I'm not directly convinced that that block is valid. But what I am convinced of is that out of this committee of uh, or this randomly selected group of 100 validators, let's say at least 70 of them agree that this block is valid. Mm -hmm. And so if I trust that you know, the majority of these uh, participants are all honest, then because it's all randomly selected, you know, the attacker can't just like force themselves into one committee. And, and so, you know, the attacker is going to be evenly, uh, evenly spread out too. And so if, you know, the entire set of validators is mostly honest, every committee is going to be mostly honest. And so like bad blocks are not going to go through, right? So that's like one simple form of sharding. There's also other more clever things that you can do. So for example, there's this concept of uh, ZK snarks, right? I'll call it as your knowledge proofs. So this is the idea that you can make a cryptographic proof that says, I verified the, or I ran some complex computation on this piece of data and I got this answer. Mm -hmm. And so if you make these kinds of proofs, then like if you see a ZK snark that says some block is valid, then you're convinced that that block is valid. And even if, you know, everyone in that committee is evil, like they have no way of making a, a valid proof for a bad block. Right. Like because the proof itself, like it, it is a proof that you did the computation where that proof is much easier to verify than just running the computation yourself. And, you know, the there's once again, you know, super awesome mathematical cryptographic magic behind making ZK snarks work. Um, 
Exactly. And like there's other hacks, right? Like there is another hack called data availability sampling that allows you to make sure that the data in the blocks was actually published. Um, but like basically, like if you stack a couple of these tricks on top of each other, you can create a system where like I as an individual participant can be convinced that everything that's going on in this distributed blockchain thing is correct without actually personally checking more than like a percent of it. So that's sharding. <laughs> So first, I think like the 64 can be hard forked up over time. Um, so we have uh, set it so that like there's theoretically space in the data structure for 1,024 shards. It's just that 64 of them are turned on. Um, like there are challenges with having more shards because like you have to have logic that just like checks and manages all those all of those shards. And if there's too many of them, then that becomes too expensive. Um, but you know, even still, you can improve quite a bit. And then the other thing that we're doing is if like, we're getting maximum scalability by combining rollups and sharding. Right? So this might be a good time to talk about rollups. What are rollups? <laughs> okay. And now we're moving into layer two ideas. Yes. So the idea behind a rollup is basically that, so instead of... Um, just publishing transactions directly on chain mm -hmm. and having everyone you know do all of the checking of those transactions um what you do is you create a system where users send their transactions to some part like central party called an aggregator mm -hmm. and like well theoretically you can have a system where like the aggregator switches around or, or anyone can be an aggregator so you know it, it's still like permissionless to send things um then what the aggregator does is they strip out all of the transaction data that like is not relevant to helping people update the state. So when I say the state, this is like a, this is a very important kind of technical term for blockchains. I mean like account balances, code, um, like things that are like memory, internal memory of smart contracts. So like basically everything the blockchain ha actually has to keep track of and remember, right? So ju you just st put in a. Um, you take all these transactions, strip out all the data that's not relevant to telling people how to update the state. Mm -hmm. And then you take the data that you, that's needed to update the state and then you like really compress it, right? So like, for example, if we say, you know, I, Vitalik, have an account that's 0x, AB, 5, 8, blah, 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 and it's 20 bytes. Well, instead we can say, well, I have an account that is number 1874224 in the tree. Right. Mm -hmm. And that goes down from 20 bytes to just like an index and a position, which is three bytes. Right. So you use all sorts of these fancy compression tricks and you basically just instead of publishing all these transactions, you publish this like tiny compressed blob. Mm -hmm. Right. So the amount of data that goes on chain goes down by maybe about a factor of 10. Right. And then the second thing is that you don't do the computation on chain. Instead, you do the computation off chain and there's one of two ways to do this, right? One is called a ZK rollup, which is you just provide a ZK snark that basically says, hey, look, I did this computation and uh, and, and I have this proof that here's the, here's the, you know some hash of the result and it's correct. And then you stick it on chain and everyone verifies this one proof instead of verifying all these transactions. And then the other approach is called an optimistic rollup, which is basically made of this scheme where like... First, someone says like, hey, this is what I think the result of the of uh, applying these uh, transactions is. And then someone else can say, I disagree. The result is different. And only if two people disagree, do you actually do it on, uh, do you actually just like p publish all of the data and run the whole, that, that whole block on chain. So if there's disagreements, then you just like run everything on chain and whoever was wrong, like loses a lot of money, right? So like disagreements are very rare and they're very expensive. And in a ZK rollup, you don't even rely on this like challenging game, game at all. You just rely on a proof. So, you know, the core principle is basically that instead of lots of transactions and all the trans everyone verifies every transaction, it is you take the transactions, you strip, it, strip them down and compress them as much as possible, then stick that on the blockchain. You do need to stick something on the blockchain just so that everyone else, everyone else can like keep like keep up to date with the state, so they know you know what all the contracts are, what all the balances are, and all of this. But it's a very small amount of data, and then you use some one of these other off-chain games. You know, could be this um, optimistic game, could be a zk snark to just prove that somebody out there did the computation and the result is correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're pushing like ninety percent of the work off-chain, and then you know, well, ninety percent of the data and ninety-nine percent of the computation off. -chain chain and then you still have 10% of the data and 1% of the computation on chain and so you know your scalability goes up by a factor of about 100 so 
these systems are already alive for for some applications, right? So there's something called loopering, which is just a, a ZK rollup for payments, right? So you can have you know assets inside of a, uh, inside of the loopering system, and you can go around and transfer them. But uh, what you um, and you get like much lower transaction fees, right? Like instead of five dollars, you'd have to pay like less than five cents. Um, but the only problem is that this only supports a couple of applications right now, like making one that su supports anything that you can do on Ethereum just takes a bit more work, but that's being done as well, right? So like within a few months, I'm expecting, you know, fully Ethereum, um, capable, uh, um, rollups to, um, be available as well. So, so then, yeah, so rollups, just summarizing, you know, do most of the work off chain, put only a little bit on chain, factor of 100 scaling, sharding, another factor of 100 scaling, 100 times 100 factor of 10,000, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions a second, and like, you know, there's your scalability. So I think ZK rollups, like once you accept that the technology works, are just like conceptually simpler and they have nicer properties. The reason is that they do not have this concept of a challenge game, right? Like, as I mentioned, in an optimistic rollup, the way that you ensure that the results are correct is that you let one person submit and like they just submit with no proof. They just say, here's what I think the result is. And then if someone else disagrees, they make their own submission. And then if you have two disagreeing submissions, then you actually publish it on chain and you see who's right. But for this to work, like you need to actually wait for someone to disagree. Right. So like, for example, if I have an asset inside of an optimistic rollup and I want to withdraw it, then I actually have to wait a week to withdraw it. Because like if the uh, a block that contains my withdrawal turned out to be invalid, then there needs to be space for someone to disagree with it. Right. right? Whereas with a ZK rollup, like you don't need time for disagreeing because you just have a proof. Right. As soon as a block is submitted, there is a proof and, uh, like you know, it's correct. <laughs> Right. The ZK stuff is just like you can in a ZK rollup, you can withdraw immediately. Um, you don't have to like worry about the economics of proving as much. Right? There, there's just like fewer issues. Um, the reason why ZK rollups are not winning everywhere today is because, you know, ZK Starks is still a crazy new technology, right? Like this is something that 10 years ago, you know, it existed only in theory and there was none in practice. Um, then, you know, eight years ago, people were just getting excited about it in Bitcoin conferences for the first time. Um, like four years, starting four years ago or three and a half years ago, even that was the first time you were able to make any ZK snark based anything on Ethereum. And then people started making them and ZK technology has only really become efficient enough to do a lot of things within the past, maybe one and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's new technology. It's crazy technology. It's admittedly scary technology. If you want to learn more, I also have an article about this on Vitalik.ca. Yeah, it's actually <laughs> So I think there's a really big and important difference in security models between rollups and sidechains, which is basically that rollups inherit from the security of Ethereum, right? Yes. So like if I have coins inside of Loopring or Optimism or Arbitrum um, or ZK Sync, um, then even if everyone else in the world who is participating in these ecosystems like hates me and, and wants to steal my money, I can still personally like, make sure that you know no matter what happens, I get them, uh, I get my money out. It might be a bit expensive for me to get my money out, and I have to do transactions like on the main chain, but I'll be able to do it. Whereas in Polygon, which is a side chain, and so instead of being secured by Ethereum, it's also in part secured by its own um, proof of stake consensus with its own token. So if 70% of the whole, or even 51% of the holders of Polygon tokens wanted to take my money in Polygon, they can, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, and like, to be fair, like there aren't even like the, the supply I don't think is even that widely distributed, right? So like potentially you could, you could, you know, this idea of 51% of the um, token holders coming together and stealing everything, like it's, it's not impossible, right? <laughs> I think in part, it, like I imagine, I'm not sure exactly what its capacity level is, but like I imagine it has a higher capacity because it's a bit more willing to take centralization trade-offs. And then another thing is that like if the Ethereum ecosystem, like even if it did not do that, right? If you think about an Ethereum ecosystem hypothetically scaling with sidechains, then you know you would have a hundred copies of Polygon. 
And, you know, they would each have their own tokens, they would each have their own chains. And so even if each one of those chains was only as scalable as Ethereum, you know, you, know, you could still, like the total sum of them would still be a hundred times more than Ethereum. Okay. Um, the now the thing that I want to say in Polygon's favor, just to be very uh, fair to them, like you know, oh, I, yes. I, 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 I really, you know, I, I definitely really, you know, respect uh, the work that they're doing. Yes. So you know, start with the <laughs> a, a bit with uh, that word of uh, not not criticism, caution, right? Like it's um, that they made this uh, kind of deliberate trade off for very pragmatic reasons, which is that the Ethereum ecosystem needs to scale now, and there are applications that want to do something now. And, you know, if there aren't Ethereum friendly options for them, then like they're not going to just wait peacefully and do nothing for 12 months. You know, they're going to go to, you know, either Binance Smart Chain or, you know, one of some other system uh, or you know, potentially something that just has totally no alignment with Ethereum values whatsoever. Um, but whereas, you know, with, Pol with Polygon, like the best thing that you can say in Polygon's favor and against optimism is that, you know, optimism is not live and Polygon is live, right? Like it just takes more work to create a system that has these extra roll-up uh, security features. And so Polygon just said, we're going to be the system that makes a pragmatic trade-off. We're going to go... Uh, you know, functionality first, and then you know we can talk about adding back the security later. So I've talked to them, and like in principle, I, I think they're very you know open to the idea of like adding more sec more security and uh, like be becoming more uh, becoming a roll up, or at least you know add adding a polygon chain that's a roll up um, at some point in the future, which is definitely something I think they yeah you know absolutely sh should follow through on. But like the fact that like they exist now and so you know applications can kind of bootstrap now on a chain that you know even though its security isn't perfect at least it exists and people can go use it um and then over time you know the chain matures as the applications mature like you know it's i think a, a, a very reasonable strategy and i'm definitely you know really happy that they're part of the ecosystem <laughs> I think the compromise that we've been taking within Ethereum is like when we have to take the crappy solution, we look for crappy solutions that are forward compatible with becoming good over time, wow. right? Like when you build the the quick and dirty thing, like you, you you would still already have ideas in your head about you know what the the more complete thing with all the security features added on would look like, right? Even if it requires a hard fork. Um, yes, like even so, you know, like for example, with sharding, right? Like, we, yeah, I think it's likely that the first version of sharding that comes out, like, is not going to have, you know, ZK snarks and data availability sampling, for example. But we know what these technologies are. We can feel like we, yeah, you know, have wrapped our heads around them. And so we know how to build a system where we can put all the pieces in place so that it becomes very easy to bolt those components on in the future. Uh, so like if you do things that way, right, then at the beginning, you can have your system that has the functionality, but say has less security or like less sustainability or less of something else. Um, but then over time, like it's designed in such a way that it has this easy on, on ramp to adding those things. Right. And if you don't think explicitly about like being future compatible, then you do often end up with, uh, a quick and dirty solution that backs you into a corner. And I mean, there are definitely cases where like, I think the Ethereum ecosystem has suffered from that and we have had to like expend pretty significant effort on, for example, removing features that we didn't realize that we yeah, actually can't sustain. Like one big example is just increasing the yeah the gas costs, so like making some operations more expensive when they uh, because they should be expensive because they actually take a lot of time in the process. It, um, so that's you know making like thing something's more expensive, kind of like taking some functionality away. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can like be cognizant of where you're likely going into the future, and if you don't know, like even be cognizant of both the most likely paths that you'll take in the future, and coming like thinking about your roadmap and coming up with a roadmap where you know that like if you wants to do either of those things, then you have a clean path toward it. Like, that's probably the best uh, kind of practical way to be get the best of both worlds that we have. Right. So as you've said, right, the way that we have uh, set up this uh, proof of stake transition is that at first the proof of stake chain just launches on its own, right? And this is the thing that happened in December. And the proof of stake chain has been running for 
close to six months uh, now. Um, I mean, by by the time people watch this, it might actually be six months. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it isn't actually coming to consensus on anything except for itself, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea behind that is to just give the proof of stake chain time to mature, time for people to build the ecosystem around it, time to make sure that there aren't any bugs, <clears throat> and just like prove to the community that you no know, proof of stake actually is real and it's uh, and a you know, full transition is realistic because you know the thing that you're transitioning to already exists and already works. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in the future, you have this event called the merge where you basically take the activity that's being done inside of the proof of work chain and you actually move it over into the proof of stake chain so you get rid of the proof of work side completely. Uh, so the way that the merge will work is um, it's definitely gone through a few different iterations. Like the, the, the earlier versions of this actually required more work for users and more work for clients. It was much more like, oh, there's this new chain, there's this old chain, and then you, everyone has to like migrate from the old chain to the new chain. And then at some point, we'll forget about the old chain. The new version is designed to be much more seamless for users. Right. So basically what actually happens is that the old chain basically becomes embedded inside the new chain. Right. So at, starting from the merge transition block, every proof of stake chain block is going to contain a block of the what, what, what we consider now to what we consider to be the Ethereum chain today, but we'll call it the execution chain. And then at the same time, to create one of these blocks, you're not going to need proof of work anymore, right? So basically, at the same time, you would both get rid of the proof of work requirements for one of these blocks to be valid, but instead you require these blocks to be embedded inside of the proof of stake blocks, right? So you basically have like a chain inside a chain. And this is, I mean, from an architecture perspective, it's, you know, you might think it's a little bit suboptimal, but it actually has some nice properties and makes it easier to kind of think about the consensus and think about the, what we call the execution layer, like, like transactions and contracts kind of separately and upgrade them separately. Um, and it also just means that the upgrade process is extremely seamless, right? Because from the point of view of a client that's following the chain, you basically have to up up update nothing, right? You're still following the same chain and follows the same rules, except instead of checking proof of work, you'll switch to checking that these blocks are embedded inside of blocks of the proof of stake chain. The new chain is not going to hold information from what happened in the Ethereum chain before the merge, right? So like Ethereum clients of the um, that um, people are going to use like around the time of the merge and soon after the merge, yeah. they're probably just going to sync you know, like, and check the proof of work chain up to the merge and then they're going to check the proof of stake chain. Yeah. But at some point in the future, I think people will just stop bothering checking the proof of work before the merge. <laughs> It's not important. Let's see. So it's not strictly important for um app for just like in, in any like smart contract or just like applications that run on the blockchain. It can be important to users and it can be important for some applications. But we're basically saying that like maintaining and serving that is not going to be simultaneously the responsibility of every Ethereum node. If you want that information, there can be separate protocols for backing it up. And like these other protocols actually exist, right? Like there's something called the graph, which is doing some history retrieval. Potentially, you can just take that entire chain and stick it on BitTorrent. Like there's lots of ways to like archive it and create kind of customized search protocols for it. I think the biggest reason is just you know, we've been underestimating the technical complexity. There's a lot of technical complexity in making a successful proof of stake chain. There's a lot of technical complexity in actually figuring out the transition process. There's I, I actually think so. I and I, I think we've been very fortunate to not have too much social complexity around the merge. So not much drama. <laughs> No, um, I think the uh, the biggest part of the reason is just because we have been talking about proof of stake and sharding as being part of the roadmap since um, almost the very beginning of the project, right? Yes. Like the very first proof of stake blog post is from uh, January 2014, which was, you know, um, two months after the project started and like a, maybe even a, a day after the announcement. Um, so, you know, it was proof of stake was 
not something that we uh, kind of put on any on anybody by surprise. And then when the DAO fork happened, and you know the people on the ETC side split off, I think it also just happens that a lot of the people that were not willing to stomach the DAO fork and then join the ETC side, they were the more Bitcoiny types, and the more Bitcoiny types do also tends to like like proof of work more. And so like that also sort of ended up, you know, sort of like purifying the communities on both sides, I guess. So Ethereum Classic is not switching to proof of stake and, you know, they're happy with their setup. And by the time that, uh, you know, it came to the beacon chain launching and now I think the community is just very strongly in favor of the proof of stake switch. <laughs> I think early 2022 is like the most realistic. There's, I think, there, you know, there's definitely still like an optimistic case of it happening this year, but like the realistic thing to count on is definitely the um, early part of uh, neg- very early part of next year. So the thing that we had last month is uh, we had this online hackathon called Rayonism, where basically a bunch of uh, the different uh, client developers that are going to be part of the transition like hacked together some uh, test nets of uh, the post-merge Ethereum chain. So these were only test nets of uh, what would happen after the merge. They were not test nets of the transition itself. Mm-hmm. So the thing that uh, people are working on now actually is the transition. Um, so having a... Uh, full specification of both the transition and post-transition. I mean, we have specifications now, but like, you know, realistically, they'll probably need to have a couple of changes and have uh, things that continue to be ironed out. And then have a yeah, test net that does both the transition and the post-transition. And then like once you have a test network, then you just have to do a lot of testing and audit it. Um, and then you know, do some... Uh, runs on not just a specialized test network, but on, say, an existing test network like uh, Robson or Rinkaby that uh, Ethereum people um, already significantly use. And if it works, then you can deploy the transition on mainnet. I think uh, that incident was that there was a consensus failure of some kind, as I remember. Um, like basically, just different clients interpreting things in different ways, and then one of them getting kicked off the network, and then it had ended up taking a while to actually like get everyone to get back online. Like the, a big part of the reason why it took weeks to resolve, right, is because uh, it's on a test network. Like the coins are valueless, and so there's not really this big push of any kind for people to actually, you know, go and download a new client so they can start participating again. Mm. And so, you know, it definitely took a while until the chain started finalizing again. Um, but, and then also, like, th- there was, I think, another round of just not finalizing in October, as I remember. Um, the, I mean, there were definitely things that we learned. Like, there were a lot of things, especially that client developers just learned about, like, optimization and how to build their clients in a way that they can process things uh, efficiently. Uh, there's a, a lot that we learned from just, like, seeing the full life cycle of what happens when more than a third of the validators go offline and then finalization stops. And then that uh, kind of weird unusual state of the chain continues for a while and then eventually everyone who is not participating like just gets enough of their stake uh, like we don't use the word slashed we use the word leaked for this but like basically also burned um until you know the people who are participating go back up to two-thirds and then the chain goes back to finalizing so just seeing all of those edge cases play out live i think actually helped a lot and probably helped really contribute to you know, making us feel better about mainnet <laughs> So one of the lucky things there was um, that this particular bug only prevented proposals of blocks. It did not prevent attestations, right? So attestations is just a mechanism for voting on blocks. And it's the attestations that are actually responsible for the chain finalizing. So like coming to this more permanent agreement on blocks, right? So the chain was actually quite stable all the way through. Um, the um, I think the thing that we generally learn from these experiences experiences is just how valuable it is to have this um, multi-client network. Right, so this is one of these areas where I think Ethereum distinguishes itself from like Bitcoin, for example, right? That in Ethereum, we don't f- have one single client that, that 
everyone um, just runs, right? There's multiple implementations of uh, the protocol. And these multiple implementations, they're, they all process and verify the blocks that each other can you know, v verify, right? So they all speak the same language. Now, sometimes when there's a bug, they disagree. Right? And when two clients disagree because of a bug, we call this a consensus failure. And consensus failures are pretty serious, right? And when you have um, a client monoculture like Bitcoin does, then like it's more rare to have consensus failures. Though you still have them, actually. Bitcoin had a consensus failure between two different versions of the same client back in 2013. Um, but they're less likely to happen. But the interesting thing is that the multi-client architecture has actually, I think, saved Ethereum much more than it's hurt it. So even in this most recent incident, right, like Prism was not producing blocks, but all the other clients were still producing blocks. Um, There's it, four others, right? Yes, it's uh, Prism, Nimbus, Teku, and the Lighthouse. Um, and then also Ethereum back in 2016 had this fun event that we call the Shanghai DOS attacks. Uh, they're called that because uh, the attacks started like right on uh, the first day of a of our annual conference at DEF CON that happens to be in Shanghai that year. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happened like basically was that someone came up with a way to create blocks that were very slow for one client to process, but not the other client. So at that time, there were basically two Ethereum clients. They were, they were called Geth and Parity. Um, right now, I think the top three ones are Geth, Nethermind, and uh, Besu. Um, but what, what happened as a result of us having two clients is that the attacker was just not able to come up with blocks that both clients were like ex uh, completely failing at processing. And so like a lot of the miners and a lot of the network participants, they just kept on switching between the two implementations, depending on which one worked. And that actually really helped uh, the, cha the, the chain uh, kind of survive through that month of attacks as the attacker just like kept on hammering at our system and identifying all of the weaknesses and just like forcing our clients to do this, you know, rapid sprint of just like optimizing the hell out of everything and make sure there aren't any of those uh, DOS blocks or uh, and DOS bugs remaining. Um, so that was another example. And then like as a counterpoint, as a counter example, so like something that also shows the point from the other side. Um, Bitcoin had this bug in 2010, right? The uh, balance overflow bug. Basically, someone created a transaction that had two outputs, and those outputs had like were both of a few billion Bitcoin, so like about two to the power of 63 satoshis. Mm -hmm. And then if you add those numbers together, you you go above two to the power of 64. And of course, you know, computers like w once you go above two to the power of 64, you wrap around, and so. The Bitcoin nodes thought that there was enough money to pay for the transaction because it was asking for, let's say, like a billion Satoshis or something. But actually, it was asking for two to the power of 64 plus a billion. And so, you know, the attacker just managed to create like billions of Bitcoin out of thin air. And this was not only discovered and fixed after something like 12 hours. Um, but you know, if there had been, like, if Bitcoin had been a multiple implementation system, then what would have almost certainly happened is like one of the clients would have bugged out, but the other clients would have probably you know actually had a check for that, right? And so th there would have been a consensus failure, but at least that would have um, like alerted everyone that there is a problem very uh, quickly, and it also would have given everyone just like obvious social permission to go and you know pick which whichever one of the chains is correct and solve the problem. Um, so like that's, I think, a big learning that we've had from multiple of our experiences in the Ethereum ecosystem, just like validating this multi-client model. And like, to be fair, it's a model that we get criticized for a lot, right? Like Bitcoin people talk about, you know, the risk of consensus failures that this creates. Um, VC types are like, well, you know, isn't it expensive and wasteful to fund three software teams when you could just be making, you know, one quote focused effort? You know, they, they love the word focused. And, like, you know, <laughs> Ethereum is not that, but it's amazing despite not being that. Yeah. Um, the, um, basically, yeah, so that, so that was interesting. Um, and then you know, there have definitely been other learnings as well just from like seeing the chain live and you know seeing what actually is the staking experience like what are the actual incentives for all the different participants um so i definitely feel like we're gaining a lot from this sort of one year of uh, trial running the chain before we actually make all of ethereum depend on it mm -hmm. 
So and the thing that uh, always attracted me about Bitcoin is, you know, these values of you know decentralization, creating these open permissionless systems that anyone can participate in and that aren't just going to flop over and die if whoever created them gets bored and like you know, that are resistant to like whoever runs them breaking the rules and all of these things, right? And I think that pretty strongly that these principles are like really valid and important to much more things than just money, right? Like Bitcoin is uh, <clears throat> the blockchain for money and Ethereum is uh, built from the start as a, gen a general purpose blockchain, right? It's, you know, there is Ether the asset on Ethereum, but then you can also make you know decentralized financial th things what, what we call DeFi today. Um, you know, you can make like ENS, the decentralized domain name system, um, you can put make prediction markets on it. You can uh, make totally non-financial systems that just like keep track of whether or not some certificate was signed or whether or not some like cryptographic key got revoked. There's this big long list of like just interesting things that you could use about blockchains to do, right? Like basically, they are sort of the missing piece that. Um, where without them, the kinds of things that a decentralized computer network can do is very limited. And once you have them, you know, a lot of those limitations end up going away. Uh, and so Ethereum was like always from the beginning about that, right? It's about like, hey, this isn't just money. This is, there's so much more that you could do if you could just go ahead and make any infrastructure or you know, digital institution or DAO or whatever you want to call it, where you the kind of the base layer of the logic is just executed in this open and transparent way where everyone can see what's going on. Or, you know, if you like your zero knowledge proofs, at least everyone can see proofs that prove to you that what's going on follows the rules. Um, and you know, you don't need to like just constantly keep trusting centralized actors. And hence the smart mm -hmm. contracts exactly as, as being a sort of a core technology as part of Ethereum. Yes, exactly. Smart contracts, the uh, computer programs that are running on Ethereum, they are like the core of what makes Ethereum general purpose. Yeah. Um, so I think, like, I do think that, you know, there's a lot more that wrong with the world than just money, right? Like, I'm not one of these people who thinks that, you know, if you get rid of fiat currency and you replace it with cryptocurrency, then suddenly wars are going to go away, right? Because, like, first of all, um, you know, like, Seigneurage revenue is only a small portion of government revenue, right? It's like, what, 5 10%, something like that. Second of all, like, if you are the sort of, um, this is one of the things I don't even get about their philosophy. Like, let's say you're the sort of person who is a, like, an extreme and very distrusting libertarian, and you think that these governments are terrible, right? Like, we we know today that governments fund a combination of, uh, you know, things like welfare and things like, you know, the military that, um, you know, goes and, like, bombs people in Afghanistan, right? And the so the question you have to ask is, like, okay, you... Um, with your new, um, you know, ma magic newfangled uh, cyber currency that takes over the world, ma take away the government's ability to, to have seniorage revenue, and so you reduce the government's revenue by ten percent. If the government is that evil, which portion of its um, expenses is it going to take that ten percent from? Is it going to stop the bombing people in Afghanistan, or is it going to cut welfare? If you think it's the first, you have a very optimistic view of the government, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So that's. I guess my perspective on like why the whole um you know we're going to save the world and create and uh, cr create peace by like denying governments the right to stealth t taxation kind of perspective doesn't really make much sense for me. I mean, I do think that there is real value that comes from a yeah, decentralized and open currency. Like just the fact that there is a financial infrastructure that anyone in the world can, you know, go ahead and use, right? Like it's uh, and that's something that can easily be a big boon for people, right? There's a lot of places where the uh, currency in, is much less stable than the dollar. And, you know, these people, like, they don't, like, well, if they use Bitcoin, they, their only option is to get Bitcoins, right? Which, you know, are also pretty volatile. Um, if they use Ethereum, then, you know, they can get Ether, but then they can also get stable coins, right? And you might think that, you know, oh, you're not being ideologically pure. And now you're giving them stable coins, which are mirroring dollars. And obviously dollars are going to collapse too. But the reality is that dollars are vastly more stable than the Venezuelan Bolivar. Uh, so like there are really like, meaningful and beneficial things that you can give to people by having a, a global and open financial system. But I think 
if he wants to actually do that, like you have to have much more than just a currency, right? And then if you want to go beyond financial things, then you know you have to obviously have much more than a currency, and then you know you also have to actually actually take scalability seriously because the non-financial applications, like nobody's going to pay five dollars a transaction for them. The other one's categorically forbidden. Yeah, categorically <laughs> forbidden. Is there any cryptocurrency based on cats, actually? I, I think there are. Like, was there was cat coin, there was nan coin. For some reason, they just didn't catch on as much as uh, the dog coins did. I definitely feel obligated to correct the record. I definitely do not fear the Doge. Okay. You no, know, I love the Doge. Um, I actually vi visited the Doge in uh, Japan a few years back. It's uh, uh, she's an amazing dog. She's uh, still alive. Wait, the original Doge? Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> so you know, we accept Doge every every year for our annual DevCon conferences. Um, so and. I definitely, you know, don't think Ethereum is opposed to dog coins. I mean, you know, I kind, of, I kind of wants to think, feel like, you know, Ethereum is at least a little bit in spirit itself a dog coin. And then, you know, as I as I mentioned, you know, I lo I love Doge. I bought the, I bought a bunch of Doge. I still hold some a bunch of Doge. The um, on the scalability question, like the, the challenge basically is like the limits uh, scalability as a and the trade offs with centralization, right? Like if you just increase the parameters without doing anything else, then it just becomes more and more difficult for people to validate the chain and it uh, just becomes more likely that the chain becomes centralized and becomes vulnerable to all kinds of capture. Mm -hmm. So does it need like some of the layer two technologies that we've been talking about? Um, I mean, I personally think that, you know, if uh, Doge wants to like, somehow bridge to Ethereum and then people can trade Doge thousands of times a second inside of a uh, loop ring, then, you know, that would be amazing. Um, I mean, if they want to just like take ZK rollup style technology and just have thousands of transactions a second on their own chain, then that's, uh, you know, th that would be a great outcome as well. I, I definitely think there's room for... You know that uh, there's that meme of Doge like taking over, mm, like that yes, storm. Yes, I, I've seen it. Is there a way to ride that uh, s that storm, that wave of the Doge that's yeah. taking over? I think if we could have a yeah, secure Doge to Ethereum bridge, then you know that would be amazing. And then when Ethereum gets its uh, scalability, any scalability yeah, thing that works for Ethereum assets, you would be able to also like trade wrapped Doge with extremely low transaction fees and very high speed as well. That's, it's definitely something that's in its infancy. There definitely have been some cross-chain interaction things that have been done before. Um, so one, the earliest is probably the concept of merge mining, right? When a chain just makes its entire um, proof-of-work algorithm dependent on the proof-of-work algorithm of another chain. And so I think famous Dogecoin actually merged mines to Litecoin, which is, I think in retrospect, not looking like a very good choice because now Dogecoin is bigger than Litecoin. <laughs> um, but... Um, you know, if there's potentially some way for Dogecoin to merge mine with an Ethereum proof of stake of some kinds, then like that could be an interesting alternative. Um, if um, so, that's one type of like chain interaction. As far as like bridges, like one chain reading another chain. Early in Ethereum's history, there was this project called BTC Relay. It's a smart contract on Ethereum that just verifies Bitcoin blocks. I think uh, people stopped really caring about and maintaining it because there just weren't enough applications that were actually interested in using it at the time, and then the transaction fees got too high to actually maintain it. So I, I think if we want to make a BTC Relay 2.0 and th that becomes cheaper because you know, it uses snarks or something like that, then you probably could. But and maybe now is the time when uh, you actually... like can do that sort of one-way verification. But the one challenge, though, is that if you want to have a bridge that allows you to move assets between chains, then you, you don't just need one-way verification, you need two-way verification, right? And Ethereum can verify anything because Ethereum smart contracts can just run arbitrary code. But if you want Bitcoin to be able to do things based on what happens in Ethereum lands, then like Bitcoin would have to basically, well, they can do everything with soft forks because, like, you know, that that's their religion, but you no. Know, They'll, they'll do it that way. And if Doge wants to 
make a fork where uh, that allow, allows for a like, two-way uh, transferability with uh, Ethereum, then you know they could. I mean, I I think that would be a, a lovely collaboration to make if, if, uh, if there's interest. Uh, I think there might actually even be some multi-sig funds that has some fu- um, some funding. It's just a bounty for someone to make a bridge between the two. Oh. <laughs> I'm I'm sure that if you know they they stay in uh, the the cryptocurrency ecosystem at all, then they have to at some point. Um, <laughs> um, right? Like, yeah. You know, Bitcoin number one, Dogecoin number. I mean, you know, come on, it deserves to be number three, and then I mean, or number two, and then Ethereum can be whatever that uh, whatever that other number is. Um, but <laughs> um, the. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, That would be that would be fascinating so, when the merge happens. And I think like Elon, you, you definitely, uh, I think you would make a mistake if you were to kind of ascribe too much like sophisticated, malevolent, in, or or any inten- like deep intentionality to the whole process. I think like he's just a human being and he likes dogs, just like I like dogs. Yeah. Right. I think uh, it's definitely necessary for smart contracts so that do a lot of things to use off-chain data of some kind, right? Like if you want to have a stable coin, you need a price oracle so you know what price you're targeting. Um, if you want to have some fancy you know, crop insurance gadget, like I, was, you know, I think EtherRisk has been doing a lot of uh, good work with that in, I think it was either Kenya or Sri Lanka or both, like they're, they're making a lot of... <laughs> Uh, pr- good progress in some in some of those places. Like you need some kind of oracle to tell you, you know, did it actually rain in this particular area? Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to have like assets that mirror other financial assets, you need an oracle. If you want to have a prediction market, you need an oracle. And so, projects that provide oracles are definitely really important. I mean, there are definitely different kinds of use cases, like Augur is more about you know, events. And the Augur Oracle is designed, like, I think, differently from Chainlink, right? Like Chainlink emphasizes the whole, you know, like we have a fast automated uh, thing that just like gives you data quickly. Um, whereas Augur is more, you know, we don't give a crap about speed. Um, and look, we don't need to give a crap about speed because if you want to get your money out on a prediction market that where in reality it's resolved, you can probably just sell your coins for 99 cents anyway. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I mean, the chain link is definitely like taking a yeah, good and uh, like important part of the Oracle design space. And I'm, I'm definitely happy that there is like that project taking the task on. I mean, at the same time, I do think that, you know, their their frog army on Twitter can get a bit intense at times, but. I personally would prefer the Ethereum base layer, like stay away from trying to provide too much functionality because like once you have the Ethereum base layer making a claim about like say the US dollar to um, Ethereum price, like, and at some sense, you're basically saying that like Ethereum as a base platform st- starts making what could be geopolitical statements, right? Right. Like for example, you know, imagine if there was some you know civil war and the U.S. split up, and you had two currencies that both claims to be the U.S. dollar. Well, you know, Ethereum would would, ha- would have to pick one for the sake of everyone who's already using that oracle. So, you know, does that mean that the blockchain would be like taking a, a position in this big mega, mega political debate? So, I think like for the, just those kinds of reasons, I would personally like prefer um, Ethereum itself to be more of this sort of pure platform that just analyzes uh, transactions uh, ma- just mathematically using uh, deterministic consensus rules. And then, if you need the oracles, that can be layer twos. Mm-hmm. Like I think Ethereum like benefits from not trying to do everything at layer one and having this like very robust layer two ecosystem where you have all these projects doing interesting things. I kind of want to let the various books about Ethereum speak for themselves, um, but I don't know. I, mean, I, if, I feel like you know, since that time, I think uh, you know Charles has uh, clearly like, I mean, progressed and uh, matured in a lot of ways. And I mean, people who follow Charles closely have definitely told me that you know, like twenty twenty one Charles is very different from my twenty fourteen Charles, and I'm sure twenty twenty one Vitalik is much uh, different from twenty fourteen Vitalik as well. <laughs> 
Is this going to be one of those things where like everyone comes full circle and then 2030 Vitalik and Charles are best friends? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, not so, necessarily. So, I think such things are possible. Um, I think, uh, you know, people definitely absolutely have a right to and uh, I think should strive to just constantly change and reinvent themselves. Um. uh, There's definitely interesting ideas in there. I mean, I do think Cardano takes a bit of a different approach than Ethereum in that, you know, they really emphasize having these big academic proofs for everything. Um, whereas Ethereum tends to be more okay with heuristic arguments, and in part because it's just trying to do more faster. Um, but you know, there's definitely very interesting things that come out of um, you know IOHK research. And so, Is there... interesting. I'm actually the sort of person who thinks deep rigor is overrated. Um, the reason why I think deep rigor is overrated is because I think like the the in terms of like why protocols fail, I think the number of failures th- or that are outside the model is even more important is like bigger and more important than the failures that are inside the model, right? So like if you take selfish mining for example, like the, the, the that original discovery from 2013 that showed how. Um, Bitcoin does like it, even if it has a fifty percent uh, fault tolerance, assuming everyone's honest, it only has a yeah, you know zero to thirty three percent fault tolerance depending on your network model. If you assume uh, rational actors, and like to me that was an that, that was a great example of like an outside the model failure, right? Because traditional consensus research just up, up until or before the yeah, blockchain days did not think about like incentivization much, right? Like there was a little bit of thought about incentivization. There's like so, a couple of papers on the Byzantine altruist rational model, but it wasn't that deep. It was mostly operating under the assumption that you know this we're going to make consensus between 15 participants in these are institutions, and if something goes wrong. Then you know if it was deli- we can figure out whether or not it was deliberate offline, and if they did something evil, we can sue them. Whereas you know in the crypto world, you can't do that, right? And so, like th- that whole discovery basically arose just because, like you know, the model of uh, traditional uh, consensus research just like didn't cover those possibilities. And then, if, like once you go out of that model, those like, other issues do exist, right? Um, so. But then at the same time, like there definitely are um, protocols that turn out to be insec- that do have failures inside the model. Like this reminds me of uh, the time when uh, I think I found a yeah, bug in a proposed uh, consensus implementation from uh, either BitShares or EOS. This happened around the end of 2017. Um, so that was definitely inside the model because like they had a very clear idea of what they were trying to achieve. They had a very clear description, and like there's a very clear mathematical. Um, argument for why the description doesn't lead to what they're trying to achieve. But ultimately, what you're trying to achieve can never be fully described in formal language, right? Like, this is the big discovery of, um, you know, the AI safety people, for example, right? Like, just having a a specification of what you want is an insanely hard problem. And like the more powerful the optimizer that you're giving the instructions to, the more you have to be careful. Um, And and so, you know, I think there are kind of these two sides. And then the other thing is that a lot like a lot of the academic approach ends up like basically optimizing for other people inside of the academic system. Right. And it doesn't really optimize for like curious outsiders. Whereas like I personally, Matt, like totally optimize for curious outsiders, or at least I, I feel like I strive to. So I guess like that's my case for why I uh, like tends to behave in ways that you know occasionally traditional academic types criticize as being reckless. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, you know, there's the, I mean, there's definitely real benefits that come from like t- just taking a, a, a rigorous approach, especially when you know you know what the thing that exa- like you know what the specification is uh, of what you're trying to get, and like you're trying to kind of improve your way or provide protocols that actually provide that and like you know exactly what you're looking for i feel like realistically you probably want to do both kinds of analysis and like sometimes you even want to do both kinds of analysis in stages right like you have you want to do more quick and dirty things and you even want public feedback on the quick and dirty stuff and then later on you formalize it more and then you get more feedback um 
like in general, I guess I feel like the norms of research in the, the future, like there, it, the internet has just changed so much. There's no way that it's not going, uh, and you know, it's it's even changed like collaboration structures and like the patterns in which we yep. work with each other. There's no way that the correct structure for collab collaborative research is the same as what it was 15 years ago. But like, what combination of these existing components and of new ideas it is like that's something that's you know totally legitimate to kind of fight it out and i think it's great that there's uh, different ecosystems that have different attitudes to things like you know i think you know there's a big possibility that you know things that the ethereum uh, ways that the ethereum ecosystem approaches some problems is totally wrong and if there's other ecosystems with different principles and they can do well that's something that we can learn from <laughs> So my impression is actually that like this is more of a kind of far away impression and it could be wrong, that it might even be that one of the challenges is that AI is not formal enough. Like because AI does is very like practitioner oriented, right? Like it's all about like, hey, I found a couple of hacks and look, I ran them and look, you know, they seem to improve classification accuracy from, you know, 0 0.684 to 0 0.773. Yep. Uh, so a lot of the time, like there just isn't actual science behind like why this hack works and why this uh, uh, other hack doesn't work. You just sort of like trial and error your way into it. Mm -hmm. um, but And like I could see how that approach works, but at the same time, like that approach is not good for legend for example like it's not good for like understanding what the heck is actually going on like how these kinds of systems conceivably might fail like there's even you know a debate on like can you take gpt3 like things and just scale them up and their intelligence will continue to improve or is there just like some types of reasoning that they're fundamentally bad at and like you they're not going to get good at it no matter how much you like scale this exact same approach and add more hardware to it so Having like thinking about what's going on more explicitly, I mean, my understanding is that a big part of uh, AI safety research is trying to do that sort of stuff, right? And formalize, yeah, formalize, try to improve just AI legibility, like trying to understand, you know, if the AI makes some classification so we can actually see like what happens and like what's going on in the middle. I mean, whereas with crypto or with traditional cryptography, you know, it's like very much not. Well, OK, I mean, I, I shouldn't quite say that it's um, traditional cryptography is this interesting mix of being very formal and being very informal because it's very formal with given these security assumptions, prove that the protocol works under these security right. assumptions. Yeah. The places where it's very informal is like, well, how do we even know that there isn't an efficient algorithm for factoring numbers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we kind of tried it for 40 years. And then, you know, so far, no one's found anything better than the gen general number field sieve. And like, okay, fine, we'll just assume it's fine. You know, how do we know you can't um, find uh, uh, the, the discrete log between two elliptic curve points? Like, no. Nah. Did it a couple of decades. No one's found anything uh, fa uh, faster than like baby step, giant step stuff. Uh, so that's and like there's there's a there's definitely uh, ways in which that approach really makes sense, right? Because at least you can concentrate your analysis on a small number of building blocks. And like, you know, you do have some intuitive reasoning about those building blocks, but like at least there is a small number of building blocks and lots of people are looking at them. And then everything else just sort of gets formally built on top and you actually can like mathematically reduce the security of big things to building blocks, right? Like you can have mathematical proofs that say, you know, if you make a ZK arc of a yes statement when in reality that statement is false, then you can use that to like extracts information out of elliptic curves that, you know, it completely breaks the problem or something like that. Mm. Uh, so. Probably. Yeah. And then in blockchains and cryptocurrency, I think the one area where consensus like mechanisms is still more an art than a science is that these aren't just like technological systems, they're crypto economic systems, right? And they make assumptions about people. And which assumptions you can make about people is not something that you can prove with math. Right, the, the, even just the basic 51% uh, 
Exactly. People are honest. Yeah. Can you trust the 51%? Um, if you can't trust the 51%, can you trust the other 49% to be able to coordinate on like making their own fork? What yeah. will happen to coin prices? Like how do people as like human beings react to these events? Like there, there's all of these assumptions. Yeah. But you no, know, at the same time, look, if you can write down the assumptions, then you can like do formal things with them. <laughs> definitely surprised by like nfts in particular like i even actually i think might be on record somewhere on some tech conference panel like they were asking you know um it was one of those overrated or underrated sections and ask about nfts and i thought hey, and i said like hey i think nfts are overrated yeah and you know in retrospect that turned out to be quite wrong um i think like i guess i just personally can't really relate to this concept of like spending a lot of money on a thing and like there's nothing you know there's no clear kind of understanding of why that thing would uh, maintain its value right. um uniqueness of a thing having value right exactly like, yeah that's like i definitely am like cannot really understand you know the psychology behind like buying you know paying two hundred thousand dollars for original art painting i'd be like you know if i had a mansion just like give me photocopies of everything you can hang three photocopies of uh, the, the the Mona Lisa. Actually, why well, would even have the Mona Lisa? I think I'd probably just like have some Nyan cats or something. That's one thing where mathematics or theoretical computer science cannot formalize why the heck NFTs are valuable exactly. at all. Exactly. But the thing that I, that it, uh, makes me very happy about the space now that uh, it has happened is that I mean this gets back to the conversation that we had at the beginning, right? Like I'm interested in this concept of decentralized uh, public goods funding, right? Like I want things that are good and valuable to as much as possible also be things that can you know economically sustain the people who produce them right yes. because if you don't have that then either the public goods just don't get produced at all or people make like centralized versions that have some of the properties and try to be substitutes but actually just like concentrate control in a very small group right um, and you know both of those things are not very nice uh, so the nice thing about NFTs would be, well, if you're an artist and you can you know, just mint NFTs and this is a source of revenue, then like, great, that's another stream of revenue for, you know, creative work that often does still get uh, get underfunded. And that's amazing. It's, I think it's definitely a gray area. Like there's definitely things that are really and actually scams. Like, I mean, BitConnect would be one example of uh, something that's away on the scam uh, spectrum. Did you see their 2017 promotional video, by the way? Oh, BitConnect? Hey, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. What's up, what's up, what's up? BitConnect. <laughs> uh, this is, it was this three minute, 48 second video that no. was just of this guy uh, like making this totally crazy rant. And it was at some conference in Vietnam where they were, of course, like trying to convince a whole bunch of people to buy this coin. And they had these claims about how it would go, to, go up in value. Yeah. That was definitely like the peak of these uh, pure... Uh, completely scammy coins and you know the, the, that was definitely really terrible and i actually i feel like we have less despite cryptocurrency as a whole being bigger we actually have uh, quite a bit less of that now but then of course you know there's this bit this spectrum of things that are not completely scams um and then things that are not scams and that are technically totally fine projects but where the their community is just incredibly sketchy and then all the way to you know things that are where the community is nice but maybe the the project is just fundamentally incapable of achieving what it's trying to do or the community doesn't realize and then you know really good projects right so like if you want to go a step like well, if that's a hundred percent scam, then like you know, what would I call like say eighty percent scam? Well, like Bitcoin SV is one example. This is a Craig Wright's fork of Bitcoin. Like theoretically, it's a blockchain, right? It's a fork of Bitcoin. It has some, um, you know, five hundred twelve twelve megabyte blocks. If you really wanted to, you could use the blockchain. You know, it's uh, it satisfies the properties that you know you can send transactions onto it. You can probably uh, you know use it as as a backup to store your files if you really wanted to, just because it has uh, it has so much space you know it might fail but like it's the but at the same time like you know as we basically said like craig wright is a scammer and like half the you know community is just totally batshit insane 
Yeah, like I think, you know, in the case of BSV, like the humans, they yeah, make just completely wrong and just obviously r wrong claims about like what BSV is capable of accomplishing and you know, like what it conceivably could accomplish. And like there's just a lot of aspects of it that make it feel like a money grab. So that's one example. And then, you know, you got to go a bit further and then, you know, you have like the Trons of the world and like, you know, that's a platform, you know, you can use it, you can do, you can do stuff on it. But at the same time, like, you know, they did plagiarize the IPFS white paper and then, you know, they, in that yeah. space. I mean, like in the case of Bitcoin, like I would definitely not call Bitcoin a scam. Right. right? That's, uh, <laughs> again, right. I would not, I would, I, mean, I would also not call Litecoin a scam. Yeah. There's people who call Litecoin a scam because they just like say, oh, look, you know, it has no fundamental use case and the concept of being silver to Bitcoin's gold, Bitcoin's gold is just like stupid. And, you know, like milli Bitcoin is the silver to Bitcoin's gold. Um, but the, um, at the same time, like if you have these people who just, you know, they do seem to earnestly believe this and uh, like they are trying to just like make a Litecoin be a Litecoin as, be as best as they can, then like that's, to me, that's enough for it to not be a scam. Yeah. Um, that's, and then, so yeah, I think the, the biggest gray area is definitely between like projects that are earnest and, but, you know, they have just all sorts of these like different combinations of flawed qualities to them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely a very yeah, ch challenging space to navigate. I mean, you know, it's uh, in some ways a reflection of the world at large. Mm. The, like, the impact of this. Like imagine like Mac versus PC wars if everyone who bought a MacBook like, had 10 Apple shares inside of it and everyone who had a PC had 10 Microsoft shares inside of it. And then you had, you know, the, the elites who bought their Macs back in 1983 and uh, they spent $500 dead and now they have $40 million and they uh, just think that they're these gurus who understands the future of finance and geopolitics. And they make theories about why, you know, Apple is the one that's going to bring freedom to the world and uh, Windows is like, is you know, so secretly true. aligned with the axis of evil. This... I think I hope to see the concept of uh, why, uh, of uh, seeing your parents and grandparents die just slowly disappear from the public consciousness as an experience that happens over the course of uh, half a century, the same way that getting lost in, in a city slowly disappeared over the public consciousness over the last 50 now that we have smartphones. I'd say absolutely. And I'd say it's a yeah, battle where we're really st have started over the last five years in particular to see the first cracks of uh, you know, humanity st um, make, starting to make things that look like they'll turn into victories. I definitely think that we can get there. Um, I definitely think that it's the sort of thing that's going to take an insanely huge amount of work. And I definitely think it's the sort of thing where, you know, once we figure out the first crop of problems and like people start living to 150, we'll just realize that there's like 10 other problems that kill you half as slowly and we'll have to do more work. But, you know, the good news is that this, this is, you know, Aubrey's longevity escape velocity argument that if you get everyone to live to 150 now, then, you know, you have half a century to fix all those other problems as well. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I'm optimistic for that reason. I think um, it you definitely do not want to underestimate uh, human ingenuity, especially over the long term. Like just to look at what happens to computers between you know the ENIAC in 1950 and where we are in 2020, right? Like that's a span of 70 years. Um, so like you know both of us, I think with uh, you know even just present day technology, you know, I have like at, least, at least 70 more years to live. So just like imagine what kind of sea change will happen in biomedicine during that time. And the other thing that made me optimistic is that I actually think COVID has been this um, kind of event that's really a kind of pushed um, biomedicine and mm -hmm. especially like activist approaches to biomedicine really into the public consciousness, right? Like it basically, it's put people into this mindset that, you know, wait, but like, you know, it's not just like, you know, the bits and tweets that are, are going to save the world. You know, the bio is actually like super important and huge. 
and um, n- you know ultimately what's uh, ending the ending covid basically you know is uh, the, the vaccines and the vaccines have just been you know amazing and uh, if you can take that energy and start uh, and also like this uh, i think philosophical attitude that i've noticed like I think the way that I would describe the philosophical attitude here, this is going more depth first, <laughs> is that I think the way that I kind of interpret part of what I would call late 20th century ideology is that there is this mentality that, you know, nature is good and disruptions from nature are bad and generally you want to minimize disruptions from nature. And like this exists everywhere in the political spectrum, right? So there's nature as in literal nature. And my view is that like the right wing version of that is markets as nature, right? Um, markets as nature. That's yeah. Right. Like, you know, the, the way that that like that kind of philosophy talks about, you know, markets and like the goal of not interfering with them. Like, you know, it's very, it, it is very kind of like nature styled. And then of course, you know, the, the, the conservative one, which is like traditional culture that existed before the activists uh, started controlling everything as also being a kind of nature. Um, but the 21st century attitude and like really COVID, you know, has like, flipped a lot of minds because with COVID what's happened is that, well, no, like it's not, nature is not safe, right? The default is that is like, you know, untold um, misery and suffering and tens of millions of people dying. The only way out for us is through like basically um, h- human ingenuity. And that frame of mind is one that's like much more friendly to one, uh, the, this other um, change of uh, minds that I want to see, which is like basically treating aging as an engineering problem, right? Like, the default is all 7.8 billion human beings that are currently on this earth are going to die and they're going to live their last decade of life in debilitating pain. And the only way to stop that is human ingenuity. And, you know, we don't, we don't have that solution yet, but, you know, if we work hard, we will. That stuff's interesting too. I, I agree. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we we have enough resources and we should just try all the parallel tracks. You know, it's great that we have uh, people just trying to make our bodies work. It's great that we have people trying to upload like, or improve brain scanning. It's also great that we have just like people improving cryonics. So like we could just like, you know, go to sleep in the freezer and um, eventually... Hopefully sometime in the future, you know, Hal Finney is going to be able to wake up um, all of this. Uh, um, and, you know, anyone who uh, gets uh, cryochronically frozen today will be able to wake up. But, you know, that's all that that's a bet, right? That's the last resort. And then the other interesting thing about um, the like extreme uploading approach, right, is um, like we're excited about space. And one of the points that uh, a lot of like, science or like hard science fiction types make is that, you know, if you want to explore space, that's a lot easier if you're not a human, right? Like one example of this is that, you know, in the context of humans, we're talking about like, oh, we're going to be able to go to the moon. Oh, we're going to be able to go to Mars. But there's this project called Starshot, I believe, right? That's basically trying to send spacecraft to mini spacecrafts to Alpha Centauri. And they literally believe that they're going to be able to get spacecraft over to Alpha Centauri, like four light years away by like the 2060s. Yeah. No, I mean, by that, traveling close to the speed of light. Yeah, exactly. Like, so base, the way it works is, you know, you have these light sails, like you basically take these a spacecraft and you shine a laser at it. And the laser is insanely strong, quickly accelerated at 100 G's for, or, no, I think it was 10,000 G's um, until it gets to 20% of the speed of light. And then, you know, it goes on your merry way, right? So if you want to be in, um, it, like personally explore the Alpha Centauri system within like two centuries or one or one century, then you know being a robot is like by far the most practical way to do it because there's no way that a human being can survive ten thousand Gs. Mm-hmm. So and it's it's definitely interesting long term, but at the same time, like there's definitely a lot of like psychological hangups and a lot of like deep philosophy that we'll just have to grapple with. Well, I think to that- get there. I'm I, I agree with that. I'm definitely in the camp that uh, consciousness is a property of the algorithm and not a property of uh, brain structure. Um, the other fun, like the kinds of philosophical things we'd have to grap- grapple with, is like once you upload yourself, like you can hit Control C. You know, like yeah. uh, it would be wouldn't it be lovely to have like ten copies of Alex Friedman and then like we could just interview everyone. <laughs> 
I guess like the one historical parallel, and like this might be a bit unfair, is that you know there have been philosophers that say that have said things like you know war gives like meaning to human collectives, and yeah. the struggle for supremacy between you know nations and races is this like big driver of progress that like that ensures that ev that everyone strives to be their best. And, um, you know, of course, uh, this viewpoint got into the head of a crazy Austrian guy and 20 years later, his soldiers were shooting at my grandparents. Um, so, you know, these days we don't really have that, but yet f life still feels meaningful. There's, we've still found other ways to, uh, or the, like, there's still a, a striving for technological progress. There's still, um, you know, a, str a, a striving for self-improvement in general. And it turns out that you know you don't actually need to have existential conflicts in order to um, in order to have that. Now maybe you need conflict, but we have other kinds of conflict, right? Like we have you know competition between businesses, competition between political ideologies, competition be between projects, mm -hmm. and so you know these are like whatever what whatever the psychological needs are, like they're just our substitutes for it. So yeah, I the guess like yeah. So if we yeah. I'm trying to say, I, I feel like once we start living to two, to the age of uh, 200, then like I'm just intuitively expecting that we'll see sub, like substitutes emerge in the same way. Interestingly enough, as I've just like personally spent more time in this world, I've started realizing that you know there is a concept of like real fight finiteness that still like exists and it might even still be a thing that provides meaning that doesn't require anyone to actually die mm. like for example like how many people from middle school or even high school that or you know yours like do you still talk to regularly i'm happy to be close friends with like four mm. or five of them okay well like in my case the answer is zero for middle school and two for high school <laughs> but you're right it, right it, it, it like, dropped uh, exactly, it drops a lot, right? And so, yeah. like, there's a lot of these just like relationships that end up being very finite. Um, yeah. A person changes their, I feel like a person changes enough of their worldview after 25 years. Was there even a study about this? Something like a person and themselves 25 years later are about as different as like two different peop uh, yeah. people or something like this. Um, so, yeah, you know, like, I mean, just like you can have conflict without bloodshed, I think, um, you know, you can, you can have finiteness and even, you know, the, the necessary sor sorrows of uh, finiteness that give meaning without like literally any anyone having to end their life. Блокчейн в индустрии иногда, когда я смотрю на просто на то то, что там русские люди делают, то что там другие люди делают, я там могу иногда чувствовать, что там вот эти вот ну люди, которые русские, там есть ну что-то, что чувствуется похожее ко мне, но я не знаю, как объяснить это. There's definitely benefits, I think, to be able to like speak multiple languages, and like once you can, right? Like you, it, it, you discover that like even your mindset changes while you're in speaking in one <laughs> yes. language versus the other. Like people have told me this. Like when I speak Russian, I sound more like I guess like to the point and pragmatic. When I speak Chinese, I sound more cute. When I speak English, I'm something else. Um, I guess. Uh, there's definitely like a richness that you're missing if you're only like in one of these uh, language bubbles. But you know, I guess the arguments on the other side would be that you know, if everyone spoke the same language, then like there would just be one bubble, right? This this is the challenge, I think. Like uh, there are actually benefits to having cultural diversity, and you definitely don't want the entire world to be too conformist. Yeah. And, well, one of the interesting things about crypto is that it's just a culture that actually like manages to like somehow you know have its uniqueness and preserve and even preserve its independence from all of all of these surrounding countries, despite being embedded in all of them. Yeah, yeah I and mean, I think like yeah, I mean, it's definitely sad whenever these groups are are, are fighting each other, um, and I, like it's definitely good for them to. Like if people can uh, cooperate more, um, but you know, at the same time, like just having like groups of people that have uh, you know different kinds of life experiences, like you know, there's definitely something to benefit from that.
thing that I've realized with money as I uh, have experienced both having a little of it and um, having a lot of it is that um, the benefit of like, like you can get the most out of um, money if you think of it not as something that like lets you do and have more things, but as something that lets you worry about fewer things. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, if you have, you know, if the, your savings are just, you know, non zero at all, then like, you don't have to worry as much about losing your job. And, uh, you know, if you feel like you're, you have a job that just like really conflicts with your values, then like if you have even six months saved up, that just makes it easier for you to say bye bye, I'm going to do something else. Um, if you have more money, then you can. <clears throat> you know, not worry about like even what you're doing be, um, needing to be profitable at all. Um, once you get more money, then like you can you know, choose transportation options and food options that just like ha have less hassle in your life and allow you to be lazier. Uh, so if you like th this aspect of just like reducing troubles and like opening up room for um, other things, I think is uh, a big part of it. Like if you just if you instead think of money as being like this positive or this thing that like gives you stuff and you try to derive meaning from the stuff, I think that's uh, much more likely to be like a road to like basically squandering that opportunity. So yeah, and I guess my, my philosophy on that is definitely more subtractive than additive there. Well, I mean, one way to think about it is like... Think of think back to like how you thought about life when you were in school, right? In school is is interesting to think about, right? Because in a lot of ways, like it's just totally outside of bounds of the you know the kinds of systems that are like social systems that we live in as a, um, as adults, or maybe not. Like maybe things like academia are intended to replicate parts of school. Like first of all, school is very totalitarian, right? Like you know you have to follow the teach the, the the teacher's instructions. The bulk of your schedule is like forced to be in particular areas and um, you know you can control um you know, the real you from you know leaving the grounds during this period this period of time um you know assign a lot of homework but at the same time also you know school is a bit of <clears throat> a bit of a post scarcity utopia in that you just don't have to worry about getting resources for yourself mm -hmm. and you know we've both like lived through 12 years of that right <laughs> yeah. so you know like what does that say about us and i think like in one thing of um, aspect, obviously, is that in it does like there's definitely like an easiness to living life if all of your decisions are made for you. And one of the challenges of uh, adulthood, I guess, is moving to this uh, world where like all your choices are much more self-directed and you just have to like, learn to live and deal with that. Um, yeah, dealing with the burden of freedom. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> some sense. it's uh, actually interesting because uh, I, in some ways, I feel like even my first like five years of doing Ethereum things, uh, yeah, my life was not even all that self directed because for a lot of it was just you know responding to obligations. Right, like someone said, oh, you know, come to speak at this event in in uh, Korea. Okay, you know, come to speak at this thing in Taiwan. Okay, um, oh, like we need. Uh, for Ethereum to launch, we need um, you know this particular piece to be done and tested. Okay, work on that, right? We know we need some uh, um, a proof of stake algorithm. Work on that. And the last year of uh, COVID life, um, like basically, I was like holed up in Singapore for much of it, right? And it gave me a lot more alone time. You know, I had much less travel, and that was definitely a very new and interesting experience for me. Some of all five, um, definitely some self-discovery. Um, I, I definitely did like take this, uh, make this very deliberate decision that like, okay, I have this time and I'm going to uh, like actually make something meaningful out of it. Um, so like one example of the things I did is I just like actually started re li um, listening to or um, audiobooks and podcasts much more. Like just this year, I basically kind of discovered that the podcast space is real for the first time, I guess. <laughs> like before that, you know, there would be things that I would get interviewed for, but yeah. I uh, 
was not really kind of like mentally incorporated. I it did not mentally incorporate this um, idea that like podcasts are a thing that you can go listen to. And this year I did. Like I, you know, my uh, friend uh, um, Carl LaFlourish, uh, one of the the Optimism people, uh, recommended Hardcore History to me, and so I went ahead and just listened to all the Hardcore Histories. Um, and then after that, you know, like yeah, listened to like Ted Lux Friedman's and yeah. then a bunch of others. Uh, and after that, I also got into um, audiobooks. Um, oh, I listened to the entire um, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, oh, the whole wow. thing, 45 hours. <laughs> that, that was fascinating. I feel like the 1930s and 40s are fascinating because they force you to like, really grapple with uh, the question of like, you know, where does evil come from? Right, like the the sort of mental puzzle that I've always ha um, had in my head is like, on the one hand, um, you know, things like the Holocaust happened, but on the other hand, if you just go and like have a coffee with with uh, people, then like a hundred times out of a hundred, everyone just seems so nice. Yeah. Like, yeah. So yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, like how do you kind of reconcile the macro and the micro there, right? And that's the sort of thing that's very difficult if you don't have um a lot of i guess the right kind of personal experience like especially if your personal experience starts off being sheltered like it was for me right like i you know the i know the stereotype is that the nerds get bullied in school but like actually for me in my school experience was just being treated with kindness by everyone yeah and uh, so that definitely made it harder to understand things. I remember actually being pretty blindsided when I started Ethereum. And then within six months, there started being fights over like who would get more shares if, if Ethereum turned out to be a company. And then I suggested we should just make it be a nonprofit. And somehow that ended up upsetting people. Mm -hmm. um, so... <sighs> So the, the, so the fascinating thing for me is that like I've been you know obviously reading and listening to the history and then at the same time just like observing things happening in the crypto space and so one of my interesting um like m mental intuitions that I've gotten is that I think m like most evil doesn't come out of greed it comes out of fear and like one example of this in Ethereum lands, right, is um, like I think the part of Ethereum history where I thought that the Ethereum community was at its lowest and even when I personally was at my lowest. I mean, if you go back to the uh, DAO fork in uh, 2016, right? So, you know, the DAO hack happens and then we made this controversial decision to change the Ethereum protocol. Uh, and we, um, you know, then there was that Ethereum classic split and as soon as that Ethereum Classic split um, happened, you know there was like a lot of anger everywhere, and uh, there started there started especially being anger when the price of ETC started like ticking up, right? So this was the time when Ether started off being thirteen dollars, and then Ethereum Classic started at zero. But then suddenly there was this one day when like ETH dropped to twelve point five, ETC went up to zero point five, and then they dropped more. And people were saying things like, um, you know, oh, this whole thing, Ethereum Classic is just a, like a psyop by, you know, the Bitcoin community and just the wealthy Bitcoiners trying to destroy Ethereum. And like in the back of my mind, I knew that that wasn't entirely true. Like there were definitely were Bitcoiners, but at the same time, like I think blaming political like internal or blaming disagreements on foreign interference right like this is the sort of thing that you know like countries uh, governments do all the time like it's a very convenient excuse right because it allows you to just like blame these things that are happening on the foreigners and avoid like actually grappling with the facts that like well no actually you have people in your very own community who just d disagree with you and have a different belief mm -hmm. and i think you know i feel like the ethereum community like during that time did not do a very good job of grappling with that and i feel like like i during that time did not do a very good job of grappling with that and so there was a lot of like blaming the bitcoiners there were also even a lot of people calling for us to use trademark law and like basically sue exchanges and like try to prevent them from a listing ethereum classic and like to me that was very unethical right like this uh like using like basically using the government as a weapon to uh, try to attack the other cryptocurrency and like destroy it as like goes completely against them, um, you know, the ideals of freedom and, you know, like things that at least in theory we're supposed to stand for. Um, but, you know, like in that particular time, 
like basically what was happening was that you know the ETC price was rising and at the same time the ETH price was dropping in lockstep and it re- and there were a lot of bitcoin people basically saying this is the end of ethereum and i think a lot of people really were afraid that ethereum would be just like completely destroyed as a result of this and so like that's the, where the anger came from exactly that that's yeah exactly it came from the fear and like that's what i like allowed people to rationalize like an abandonment of principles that I think they would not have um, accepted in other sort of circumstances. And I, mean, I, I definitely, like to, to some extent, played along with this myself, right? And I, I do definitely regret that to some extent. Uh, well, I and mean, I, I definitely regret like the, the excesses completely. Um, but so that, and then obviously, you know, Bitcoin block size war, similar sort of stuff happened. Uh, so like that that insight was interesting um because like it does mentally make a lot of sense right like when you're actually afraid that you know unless you act in some way that you know your entire world is going to collapse like it's much easier to just rationalize you know forgetting your principles and doing whatever you have to to just save the specific thing that you care about this is the lex free podcast